Um, at this time, I, before we begin our invocation, um, I want to um, invite Pastor Ellen Silvery. Pastor, where are you? There you are, sir. Um, from the 16th Street Day Adventist Church to lead us in the invocation, followed by Lily McCord to lead in the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you please uh, rise? All right, thank you. I'm from the 16th Street Seventh day Adventist Church. God bless you. Would you bow your heads as we pray? Loving Lord, we acknowledge your presence with us this evening. Thank you for keeping us through dangers seen and unseen and for bringing us here safely. As this council meets to conduct business for the city of San Bernardino, we realize that the problems which plague our nation also plague us. Violence, homeless people, racial hatred, poverty, and many more. We are thankful for the progress we've experienced in the city thus far, be it small or great. Give this council more than human wisdom as they address the needs of this city. And may the governance of this city always be with integrity, transparency, and honesty. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor, and we thank you, Lily. It was a delight to visit with uh, the family this, morning, or this afternoon, and we appreciate it your presence here tonight. Thank you. This time we move on to our appointments. I have a motion to approve the following individuals. Dr. Reginald Woods to the Animal Control Commission. Michael Tacky to the Arts and Historical Preservation Committee. Robert Stevenson to the Arts and Historical Preservation Commission. Alyssa Payne to the Arts and Historical Preservation Commission. Paul Sanborn to the Charter Review Commission. Kimberly Knoss to the Elected Official Compensation Commission. Gil Bateo to the Elected Official Compensation Commission, Alyssa Payne to the Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Commission, Gil Bateo to the Personnel Committee, and Carlos Jaramillo to the Planning Commission. And uh, members, I um, encourage members to, um, is there a motion for that approval? I'd like to uh, pull, uh, pull two to, separate, uh, to vote separately on, okay. uh, seven and nine. Very good, is there a motion to move the balance? Move the balance. Very good. Name, Say again. Seven and nine, seven and nine which ones? Uh, Councilman Sanchez, what, which ones are those? The ones you're pulling? Uh, item seven, and item nine. Would you? What? What are the names? Okay. Move the balance. There's a motion to move the balance. With discussion. I'll second. Okay. If members would cast their votes, please. Oh, sure. Um, that would be. Uh, apologize for being a little bit late. Item number. Five, Paul okay, very good. Items five, seven, and nine are pulled and move the balance uh, with the second. If second. members would please cast your votes. On the appointments mentioned, the motion to approve was made by. Uh, Ms. Richard, the second by uh, Mr. Figueroa, and the item passes 7 to 0. Very good. Um, item number 5, the pull by Councilman Charette. Sir, state your um, objection. I, it's, it's kind of ironic. Uh, Paul Sandborn, I think, wants to give everybody a raise and always has the city council. My mic's not on. Um, but just for some of uh, the comments that have been made in the past, uh, calling me a racist and others, I just have a hard time supporting him, so by voting no. Very good. Is there a motion to entertain and pass item number five? 
Just for clarification, this isn't for the elected official compensation board. This is for charter review. It, it doesn't Correct. Matter. Okay. It doesn't matter. Okay. Item number five. Is there a motion uh, to approve? I'll make that motion to approve. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Very good. Members would cast their vote on item number five. On item five, the motion to approve was made by Mr. Sanchez, the second by Ms. Richard, and the item passes five to two with um, council members Charette and Mobile Hill voting no. Thank you. Items number seven. Hold on, Mr. Charette. We're moving on to items number seven and nine. Uh, Mr. Sanchez, Councilman Sanchez, you pulled out. I'd like to abstain from both, uh, both votes for seven and nine. Very good. So stated. And if we have a motion to entertain item seven and nine on passage. All right. So... Uh, First and a second, and if members would please cast their votes. And Mr. Sanchez, could you? Hold on, hold on, just a minute. Mr. Mobile? Uh, I don't want to hold up the, 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 the vote. I'll just, after you give the vote, I'll uh, make a comment. <laughs> Seven and nine, the motion to approve was made by Ms. Richard. The uh, second by Mr. Mulvihill, and the item passes Very four good. to one with two abstentions. Very good. Thank you. And the, the comment I made is that uh, some time ago we revised the form because we were concerned that people who would get appointed to, say, the Arts Committee or the Planning Commission and so forth, have some background or have some interest. And I looked at some of the forms and... Uh, some of the applicants, there's really no relationship between what they've stated and the particular commission that they're looking to be appointed to. And I guess my point is, is that if you're appointing somebody, when they fill out the application, make sure they address the committee that they're anxious to become a part of. Because I just, uh, again, uh, somebody wanted to be appointed to the Arts Commission and they just simply there's nothing on their application that indicates that have any interest in the arts, okay, uh, any background in the arts, and, and so forth. So, thank you. Okay, the item passes. All commissioners, we're calling all commissioners, please. Uh, if you join me here, uh, Dr. Reginald Woods, please come forward. Michael Takia, Robert Stevenson, Alyssa Payne, Paul Sanborn, Kimberly Canas, Gil Bateo, Alyssa Payne, Gil Bateo again. And Carlos Jaramillo. Ms. City Clerk, would you please administer the oath? Okay, so when I get to state your name, please. Okay, Michael Takia, Alyssa Payne, Carlos Jaramillo. Thank you, Ms. City Clerk. We appreciate it. At this time, I call forward Dr. Reginald Woods to join me, please. Dr. Woods, it's been a delight to get to know you a little Thank bit more. You. He joined me in uh, Detroit and Denver, and I think you have valuable credentials to our community, community strength and efforts for our community. And, sir, we're delighted to appoint you to uh, this commission, the Animal Control Commission. Thank you, sir. A few words? Okay. Thank you. I appreciate this appointment. I've been a long time um, member of this community, and uh, we're on the increase, going upward, and I'm glad to be a part of that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I ask uh, Mr. Takia, Mr. Michael Takia, and I think this is Commissioner, I'm sorry, Council Member. Who appointed Council Member Takia? Mulvey Hill. Sir? Yes. There you are. 
Apologize. Thank you, sir. How are you? It's good to see you. Right. Thank you. Councilman? And uh, do we have the lapel pins? Yes. Thank you. Um, Mike is, uh, you, I just made this uh, comment that uh, to, when you're appointing people to commissions that uh, make sure they have a background in what they're doing. Uh, I'm appointing uh, Michael to the uh, Arts and Historic Preservation Commission. He, Michael, for 30, over 30 years was the pianist for the San Diego Symphony. And you taught in San Diego Unified Music yes, for how many years? Choral music for 25 years. For it's many years. For many years. So Michael is, is extremely qualified to, to take this position and I'm honored to have you on there. So I'm going to present this to you and we have a... Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Montmano. And I have a, a uh, limited edition, highly sought after lapel pen <laughs> and wear it proudly. <laughs> and you can make a statement. Make a few, can you make a comment? I, I'm honored to serve on this board uh, as I've devoted my life to the arts and to improving the arts in San Bernardino and I hope to do justice to its cause and uh, I thank you very much for appointing me, Mr. Mulvey. Thank you for accepting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. This time I call forward Robert Stevenson. Mr. Stevenson, you are appointed as my mayoral appointee to Arts and Historical uh, Commission and we wish you a lot of success and luck as we... Uh, join together in aligning ourselves and our priorities for our community. Thank you, sir. Thank you. A few words? Thank you very much. Perfect. <laughs> All right, Alyssa Payne to the Historical and Arts Historical, I'm sorry, Arts and Historical Preservation Commission. And Alyssa, I'm also gonna, <laughs> give you, so we can save our time, uh, you are appointed to Arts and Historical Preservation Commission and also to the Parks and Recreation Commission. You're my appointing commissioner. It's a delight Thank to get you. to know you a little bit more and we appreciate you. Thank you so much. A few words? I just love being a part of San Bernardino as being a mom. I work and worship here. Everything, our life is based here and I see nothing but positive growth despite what people think. I'm meeting people weekly that are working together with no other alternative but to just bring the city up, and I can't wait. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Paul Sanborn, my friend. Paul Sanborn, come on and join me. You're a trusted good friend of mine, and I appreciate you and your friendship. Uh, I've known Paul for several years, and I just admire. Plus, you're losing weight. Yes. You're looking good. Yes. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. Two words. The only thing I want to talk about tonight is if there's any vets in here, people at the end of San Bernardino up at the north end, people who keep talking about the insurance and the fire insurance is going up, up, up. And the point is that USAAA, if you're a vet, you need to get on board with those people. They will not cancel you. They're not going to throw you under the bus. And if you're a child of a mother and dad that was a vet, you're on board. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Very good. Our next uh, appointee, uh, mayor's appointee, Kimberly Canaz. Would you join me, Kimberly? Kimberly Canaz, the elected official compensation commission representing uh, the mayor's office on that commission. Kim, you've been a great delight to get to know, and I appreciate all of your positive spirit in the North End, and we wish you a lot of uh, more continued years as you wave the banner of positivity for our community. So congratulations. A few words? I just want to say thank you for this opportunity to serve in this capacity, and I look forward to continually being a part of the positive progress in this city. So thank you. Uh, Gil Bateo, join me please, sir. Uh, Gil is appointed to the Elected Official Compensation Commission and also to the Personnel Commission, sir. You have been a, a, a delight to be with, and I enjoy your positive attitude, your community engagement, and we wish you many, many, many years and months of success on these commissions, sir. Congratulations. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just want to say there's no greater honor than public service. And I want to thank the mayor for continuing to, to have vision and positive steps in our city. And I want to thank the council members who concurred with my appointment. Thank you very much. I won't uh, let you down. Thank you.
Our uh, final commission is a mayor's appointee to the Planning Commission, Carlos Jaramillo. Carlos, you are an inspiration to our community. I really appreciate your positive attitude on a lot of things, San Bernardino. Um, as I have engaged with Carlos, his mentality is we got to grow, we got to develop our community. If you notice tonight's commissioners, there's a lot of commissioners that are representing my, my interests on uh, several of these commissions with a positive uh, background. These folks are nine out of ten of the commissioners pointed tonight are all new blood, all new blood uh, to the community, and we're excited for that. Carlos, you're one of them, uh, and we wish you a lot of success on the Planning Commission. All right. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. Your words? Thank you. I just want to say thank you, and uh, the past, uh, I've been a resident here for the past 10 years. I uh, went to Cal State San Bernardino and uh, raised my family, you know. And it's been about a year or two, no, a year since I brought my business here to San Bernardino. And I've decided to uh, stick around and uh, grow with the community. Thank you. Okay, at this time I will call forward, uh, we're moving on our presentations. Uh, Ms. Ontiveros, I saw you earlier. There you are, Ginger. Good to see you on a um, presentation on clean, uh, California Clean Air Day. Ma'am? Say a few words. Good evening. Um, thank you, Mayor Valdivia and Council. It's wonderful to be here tonight on California Clean Air Day, October 2nd. Um, it's a nonprofit statewide program uh, to encourage people to, to take action to help clean our air. Everything from changing filters to not idling your cars to planting trees. So far, more than a quarter million actions have been pledged across the state to help make sure that the air we breathe is cleaner. Um, I want to acknowledge our city for also joining joining our school board here in San Bernardino and, and uh, dozens or hundreds actually of communities across the state of California who are making proclamations in support of this work. So thank you very much. Very good. I'll trade you spots. <laughs> uh, Ginger, on behalf of the Mayor and City Council, a proclamation of the Mayor and City Council, whereas air pollution contributes to higher rates of cancer and heart and drug diseases, which adversely, adversely affect our uh, health, whereas California has some of the most polluted regions in the United States, and whereas emissions from vehicles, industry, and even household sources significantly affects the natural environment, air quality, of, and well-being of our residents, employees, and visitors of the city of San Bernardino, and whereas individual actions such as not idling vehicles, walking or biking to work and school, carpooling and conserving energy can directly improve air quality in our region. Now, therefore, the mayor and city council of the city of San Bernardino do hereby proclaim October 2, 2019 as Clean Air Day. Congratulations, and we thank, thank you for you your participation. Much. Very good. Moving on to our next uh, presentation, I'll call forward uh, the Loma Linda University uh, designated person to present uh, the School of Pharmacy to discuss American Pharmacist Month. Ma'am, you're recognized. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Judy Ho. Uh, I'm here with my classmates, uh, Martin and Tony, as well as the rest of my colleagues over here. Uh, um, thank you, Mayor Valdivia and the city council members, for allowing us to be here um, to talk to you about American Forest Assault on behalf of our school. Uh, we are students from the Little Linda University School of Pharmacy. Uh, we are in a four-year graduate program where we will receive a Doctor of Pharmacy degree after we're done. Um, the theme, um, let me get this out <laughs> as I can. So the theme for um, the American Pharmacist Month this year is easy to reach, ready to help. And that's exactly what we are as pharmacists. Um, in fact, 
the um, I don't know if you can see the screen up there, um, but 91% um, of Americans live within five miles of a community pharmacy. Um, we are the healthcare provider that patients speak to right before they take their medications. And so, um, you know, we're always willing to help and ready to um, assist our patients with any of their medication needs. Um, I personally love community pharmacy. I'm currently working uh, at Costco, and the relationship that I've built with my patients throughout the year has been incredible. Uh, it, it motivates me uh, when I see my patients putting their trust in their pharmacists and their student pharmacists. And so to me, this really defines the, um, the word community. Um, in addition to the community pharmacists, there are pharmacists in many different um, fields of healthcare, and um, these include hospital, research, industry, academic, poison control, NASA, informatics, compound, veterinarians, genomics, nuclear pharmacists, and also public health service. In fact, there are pharmacists that work directly with the Surgeon General um, to make sure that public health is optimal. And so. so to, sorry about that. So to further elaborate, uh, pharmacists often uh, practice in what we call medication therapy management. Uh, oftentimes, there are a lot of uh, issues in the healthcare system in terms of how money is wasted. If you take a look at the screens here, just uh, $300 billion alone is wasted in the healthcare overall because of therapy, uh, th medication therapy is not being properly managed. And this is where pharmacists are very pivotal for not just for the, the sake of the cost, but also for the patient safety. There's oftentimes a, un, uh, there's a lot of drug-drug interactions. Sometimes there's uh, drug disease interactions because say for an instance, you have an elderly patient who's on multiple medications, they go to the ER, they're not given the full list of medications that the patient may be on. The doctor decides to prescribe them something that may negatively interact with those medications, causing further complications with their, what they're already diagnosed with. And then next, um, this is just kind of Reiterating more what Janae was talking about earlier, how pharmacists are part of your healthcare team. Most times, you go if you're admitted to a hospital and you're on one of the uh, ICU units, you will have a pharmacist that's assigned to you, monitoring all the drug regimens that you're on to make sure that you're being optimally uh, helped, along with uh, your doctors, your nurses, and other healthcare providers. At the same time, a lot of people don't understand how clinically trained pharmacists are. We are trained to take blood pressure. Um, finding the right over-the-counter medications for you. Uh, something more than just pushing drugs at your local Walgreens, CVS, Rite Aid. And next, um, pharmacists with the opioid epidemic are becoming more pivotal with um, pain management, making sure that, you know, if there's somebody that needs to be on these medications, that they're taking them properly, taking them only as needed. If they don't have to take something that's more likely to be addictive, if they can start low, maybe go high, and if the pain does get managed more properly, they can actually be titrated down. And the next is so, uh, smoking cessation. Um, a lot of people don't know that pharmacists can actually get a lot of uh, separate advanced practice uh, licenses, and smoking cessation is one of them where they can actually uh, take, take the patient's um, current like history and how much they smoke and start them actually on a regimen for them to quit smoking. So this eliminates them possibly having to go to their doctor, which may be a high copay for them. They can just go to the local pharmacy and get this started for them. And then um, in addition to that, we also have asthma, the asthma and COPD. Um, that's just one of the other aspects of pharmacists are actually clinically trained in as well. Uh, but overall, as I had mentioned earlier, we just want to make sure that patients use their medication safely and most effectively. Uh, we're also the champions for vaccines, you know, explain to patients that are more at risk or less at risk. Um, or if, for example, Loma Linda is very big on uh, doing mission work. So in this case, our community pharmacists are very pivotal, pivotal in giving those students or anybody going on mission work the proper vaccinations they may need when going to the countries they're going to serve. And then also managing diabetes. Diabetes is very prevalent in our communities now, and pharmacists actually have extensive knowledge in how to manage these things with and without medications.
So I just wanted to share briefly uh, what student pharmacists can offer in the community. Um, Loma Linda University of School of Pharmacy um, has a long-standing commitment to serve the city of San Bernardino and the surrounding areas. Um, so we have put the list of all the um, outreach events that we do annually. Um, we provide community outreach services for um, children, teenagers, adults, um, and also elderly, especially those who are underserved. Um, so for children and teenagers, we provide education um, on medication safety or health in general. Um, we have programs for, um, that serve as, um, as um, have students serve as mentors for students who are struggling. Um, we have free music lessons um, and also tutoring at local high school and um, uh, learning centers. Um, another example, um, for adults, um, especially uh, at Hope of Hope for the Homeless, we provide health screenings, uh, we provide foot washing, we provide a free um, dinner for um, people who come. Uh, this is located between, uh, between Loma Linda and San Bernardino at Crosswalk Church. Um, lastly, we also um, visit nursing facilities called Teleku, which is um, located um, all over in the empire. Um, we provide blood pressure, um, bone density screening, and then medication management for the residents. At this time, I'm going to ask uh, Councilman Ted Sanchez and Councilman Juan Figueroa to join me, please, if you would. We have a proclamation on behalf of the Mayor and City Council uh, celebrating American Pharmacists Month. Uh, pharmacists uh, play an important integral part in our community. I know that Councilman Sanchez, Councilman Figueroa have telecoos in their districts. Uh, I think Councilman Charette, you have one too, I think, sir. Might. So we're very appreciative of American pharmacists and community pharmacists. Whereas pharmacy is one of the oldest of the health professions concerned with the health and well-being of all people, and whereas today over 254,000 licensed pharmacists in the United States specifically educated with a level of expertise on medication therapy management are ideally suited to work collaboratively with other health care providers and patients, and whereas a collaboration of pharmacists with health care providers and patients improve adherence, provide optimal medication therapy outcomes, and ensure the safe use of all medications, and whereas pharmacists provide both expertise and accessibility, which are crucial to patients fully optimizing access to medications that are not self-administered such as, but not limited to, limited to immunizations, and whereas the American Pharmacists Association and the California Pharmacists Association have proclaimed October as American Pharmacist Month with the theme, Pharmacist, Easy to Reach, Ready to Help. Now, therefore, the Mayor and City Council of the City of San Bernardino do hereby proclaim October as American Pharmacist Month. Congratulations. Thank you, Councilman Sanchez. Thank you, Councilman Figueroa. Uh, medical care is certainly a specialty, and we appreciate our pharmacists, and we thank our pharmacy students for being here tonight. We thank you for your accomplishments, and we sh wish you a lot of success in your endeavors. We want you back here in our community uh, as pharmacists, so we appreciate you. Thank you. Next, I invite the San Bernardino Chamber of Commerce. Is there a representative tonight? No, I don't see any. Uh, are there any other elected officials, uh, representatives? Councilman uh, Shrek. Thank you, Mayor. If, if I may, uh, in, in the Chamber's absence, just want to remind everybody, Saturday uh, from 9 to 9 in downtown San Bernardino will be our annual uh, rendezvous. Well, it's not rendezvous back to Route 60. I'm, I've lost track of what the name of it is now. Uh, but it, it, we refer to it as Route 66 here in San Bernardino, and it will be uh, a great event, it always is, and uh, encourage everybody to get out, and especially, uh, well, everybody, but especially those car people that are interested in classics and what have you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Um, public comments, we will now move to our public comments. We encourage uh, use of both dais, so if you would, please, I'll call your names and we'll kind of put you on deck here. So we'll utilize both uh, public comment uh, speaker desks. This time I call forward Mary Van Meter. 
Mary, are you here? There you go, Mary, if you join me, please. Followed by Clementina Pina, followed by Tammy, Tammy Barn. Tammy, are you here? Tammy Barn, ma'am, if you would, please. And uh, Clementina Pina. Ms. Pina? Ma'am, you're recognized, Mary. Welcome. Yes, I'm here because uh, we, we are petitioning for the four-way stop on uh, D Street and 28th Street. Um, it's a very peaceful neighborhood. You see a lot of people walking, seniors, children, families, but we've had high impact accidents on that corner where, I mean, I've actually seen a car out on somebody's lawn because of the accident and one on its side. And I fear that you know, something is really gonna happen one day if something drastic and terrible is gonna happen if we don't try to put up these signs because it doesn't matter what time of night it is, what time of day, people just tend to speed because it's a cut through the freeway. It's a residential street, but people take it as a shortcut through the freeway. So there's some, before something happens, tragic happens, especially to the new families right at that intersection with children, I think we need to think about strongly about putting those signs up. Thank you very much for your comments, ma'am. Our next speaker is Clementina Pina, followed by Tammy Barn, followed by Ginger Ontiveros. Ms. Pina? Good evening, everyone. Um, I just have a simple question, yes, due to the fact that um, I have a conversation with some of my neighbors yesterday. As I explained before, I live on the corner of the Northwest uh, Lincoln Drive. And one of our questions, and I thought that this is the best place for me to maybe have my answer and take it back to them. Uh, how many police officers the city increased since we being out of uh, bankruptcy? Are we actually increased any officers? Or are we still on the same position as before? Uh, Ms. Pena, the, the opportunity is to provide council feedback on your particular issue. If you have a question, we'd be happy to take that offline and address yeah. it with you. Yeah, okay. Thank uh, you, ma'am. You know, my, my second, I'm sorry, I have two questions. The second question was also, you know, all the rumors about uh, closing the animal shelter. Uh, is, are, is that something, I know it was talk before, but you know, some of the neighbors are kind of like concerned. Um, in my neighborhood, unfortunately, we have a lot of animals. People probably, because it's right next to the freeway, it's easy for them to go and drop uh, dogs. I've been together with Lynn Lumber from the Human Society. She basically been helping me to, uh, you know, find homes for a lot of those pets. But... Ms. Pena, we'd be happy, uh, staff will uh, attend to your questions, and we thank you for coming out tonight. Okay, thank you very thank much, ma'am. Thank Our you. next speaker is Tammy Barn, followed by Ginger Ontiveros, followed by Thomas Fleming. Ms. Barn, welcome. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm just here to um, ask a question or give some suggestions. I um, live with my sister, Jennifer, um, and I moved from the Bay Area, from uh, Napa Valley. And I noticed that over in, in uh, Ward 6, there's a lot of empty fields. And if you remember, Vallejo was bankrupt, <clears throat> um, just like San Bernardino. Well, they were able to just come together and, and pull together their community. And with their open fields, what they did, they utilized those open fields. It's a lot of open lots, especially right there on Mount Vernon. And they got the community together and did... Um, what they called a garden, community garden. And that helped bring in, um, not only utilize that lot, but it, it brought in the community to come together and to put together a community garden, which will alleviate people from dumping their furniture and everything else in these fields. So I'm just asking you, uh, Mayor, is this something that the, uh, you know, the city would consider doing. To, that's, that's a way of getting San Bernardino up and, and moving and rising. That's a way to just 
utilize that open space. Thank you very much, Ms. Barn. Uh, Jackie, we'll get your contact information. I'd love to engage with you offline about that. That's a great opportunity. Our next speaker is Ginger Ontiveros, followed by Thomas Fleming, followed by Lynn Ware. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. I'm Ginger Ontiveros. I'm the Executive Director of Community Engagement for San Bernardino City Unified School District and also the Making Hope Happen Foundation. It's really my honor to be here tonight on behalf of our Superintendent, Dale Marsden, and our Board of Education. I want to start by thanking uh, Mayor Valdivia for joining members of our Board of Education and our Cabinet um, in our recent Education Bridge Committee. Uh, we're able to really start talking about ways that the city and the school district can partner together, and so I certainly look forward to participating myself in future Bridge Committee meetings as a member of our Cabinet, um, and I know that our Board of Education and uh, leadership also uh, looks forward to working with all of you. I want to take a little bit of time also to let you know that our school district has invested heavily in our athletics programs, upgrading many of our um, athletic fields, and uh, we're producing some really uh, significant talent out of our schools. Uh, you've probably seen some of our recent graduates make their way into the NFL. And uh, in that vein, we'd like our future superstars of uh, for you to come and see them play. So we have this whole Come See Us Play campaign, uh, trying to get the community out to support our youth um, in their athletic games, as well as in other endeavors, uh, performances that might happen uh, throughout the year. So we encourage you to check our website in order to find out those opportunities. We want to make sure that everybody has marked their calendar for November 13th. That will be our uh, community gathering for excellence. We typically bring together about a thousand members of our community to talk about and celebrate education. This year it'll be a little bit different as we focus on the power of apprenticeships and internships to launch careers. Uh, we have uh, Susie Levine who is the former ambassador to Switzerland and also in charge of the workforce development efforts in the state of Washington. She'll be presenting at that conference. Um, and so that'll be a really powerful opportunity for us to learn what kinds of ways we can help our kids to get connected to careers locally. Lastly, I want to make sure that we brag a little bit about something that just happened this week. Um, our schools, Norton Elementary School and Arroyo Valley High School, welcomed the um, California Secretary for Labor and Workforce Development Agency, Julie Ch Su. Um, she came and spent the day with us touring our career pathways, where we're really giving our kids some phenomenal opportunities to learn and prepare for their future. So she's really engaged in that and looking for ways to support our community so we're pleased to be part of the work in uplifting San Bernardino thank you thank you our next speaker is Thomas Fleming followed by Lynn Ware followed by Joyce Seeger mr. Fleming welcome thank you uh, good evening mayor good evening to you all um, I just wanted to say that uh, I wanted to apologize directly to uh, the mayor uh, for being you know pretty rude uh, over the past few times I've been here uh, to everyone else, you know, uh, the truth is I'm not originally from here um, And you guys have these little red ants that really cause a lot of pain and these little tiny ants that swell up your leg Well me anyway, and that's what I've been to you. Um, I apologize for that, you know um, uh, Not positive like last time, you know, it's about positivity and uh, that, that's really what I'm trying to get at right um, Just working my way to it um, now, um, so I'm a runner, uh, and I run all around San Bernardino, and the lady right here, the environmentalist, uh, the environment lady, um, Ginger, uh, I see this big tree in one of the open fields, beautiful tree, and these homeless people are below it, and they just cut down that tree, beautiful big tree. Uh, I guess they didn't want the homeless there, so they cut down their home. You know, instead of, uh, you know, funding you know, a homeless shelter, you know, for these poor people everywhere, right? They cut down the tree. I mean, that's what's happening everywhere, really. Uh, you know, uh, and also, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm trying to get you an army of fans, okay? A lot of people are against you. I'm trying to get you a lot of fans. And the way to do that is to grow a great economy. How do you do that? Well, you get more money in people's pockets. How do you do that? You go to the people, right, the people who own everything, which are usually, you know, these very few amount of people who own a lot of things, 
right? The 7-Elevens, the, the apartment buildings, right? They're getting a bunch of money. If you cut that down and put more money in people's pockets, that's how you grow an economy. You get people out, and also they can save money, okay? These people can save money to start business, homegrown business instead of 7-Elevens, liquor stores, instead of mobiles everywhere, right? And that's why you have so many alcoholics and homeless and drug people, because there's nothing else. And people don't have any money because, you know, they have families. It's a very Christian neighborhood, right? So they say, hey, breed, 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 right? Have more kids, right? So these people are spending on their kids and their partners. They have no money. How are they supposed to do anything to grow the economy? So that's what I'm here. You know, I'm trying to get you an army of, of real people, not businesses who are trying to get from you. I'm trying to get you an army of people who are on your side. And that's all I got. Our next speaker is Lynn Ware, followed by Joy Seeger, followed by, I'm trying to read this, so my apologies, Carolyn Jeff or Tef? Yeah. Carolyn? There you are, ma'am. All right, Ms. Weir, welcome. Thank you. Um, in my capacity as president of the Muscoobiabi Neighborhood Association, I'm here representing neighborhood interests in our challenge of the county welfare office being established in our neighborhood. As many after many of us have spoken before you and before the County Board of Supervisors, we are still awaiting a justifiable reason why this social services project did not go through the Planning Commission for a CUP, as our City Development Code states that it should have. Interestingly, we are aware now that other develop developers in the area know that a CUP should have been required. It is apparently common knowledge. Mr. Beard and our City Planning Department should have known this as well. Why didn't that happen? Not one city official has offered to explain why Elizabeth Mora Rodriguez, this project's chief planner, believed it to be a human resource admin office as recently as July 23rd of this year, eight months after permit approval. As she has admitted to me uh, that she told residents who called with questions that it would be a human resources office. Doesn't that tell you there was gross misconduct? when the truth was withheld from even the project planner. We believe there was ill intent from the beginning and that city employees with authority wielded their power to cover up the truth. Was there a backroom deal, I ask? Only limited and false information was provided to the public and a required CUP was not in obtained. This illicit practice has been described by some as fraud. Does this city have any credibility? I'd like to think so, but no wonder I'm hearing accusations of corruption from others. For years, I have defended our city to skeptical friends and neighbors, but sadly, now I see differently. I now think that some of your practices are actually indefensible. How many of you have received campaign funds from developers or other special interests? How many times have you been asked to return that favor with a vote on the dais? or for political influence, or to turn a blind eye to this unlawful welfare office. You are all held captive to the people who slip you $1,000 or $10,000 here and there. We will be filing a, filing a complaint with the Attorney General's office to investigate this case, and the Public Integrity Office will be considering our concerns regarding unethical practices. Mr. Nickel informed me last night that neither the city nor the county is interested in speaking with us any further about this situation. We can't ferret out the truth here if we aren't all at the table. Right now, the trust is broken. Remember, elections are on the horizon, and we need people with a strong moral core. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joyce Seeger, followed by Carolyn, followed by Treasurer Ortiz. Seeger, welcome. Thank you. I'm Joyce Seeger, president of Blair Park Neighborhood Association, which adjoins the Muscoobiabi Neighborhood Association, where the TAD welfare office is being built by the county. I would like to direct my remarks tonight to the council members in wards 1, 3, 4, 6, and 7. I spoke directly to you last month also. 
A welfare office is being built in a neighborhood at 27th Street and Little Mountain Drive, and residents did not know about this until construction began. This never came before the Planning Commission or you, the City Council. Would you look the other way if this was in your ward? If you allow this, what else would you allow? Or what other issues would you remain silent on? The developer, Scott Beard, has a history of doing business by skirting the law. He has a shady past. He got a permit to build this building for one thing, and he is building it for something else. There have been a number of investigations into his activities related to politicians. In the past, the Sun newspaper reported Mr. Beard's campaign spending and campaign donations as obscene. Mr. Beard's business settled for a payment of $1.796 million to San Bernardino County for accusations of bribery against him. The list of his shenanigans is endless. The definition of shenanigans is secret or dishonest activity or maneuvering. Some of you on the council may be too young to remember this, his shenanigans, while others I am sure can remember. One of you experienced this when Mr. Beard ran against you. Lastly, I would like to address the acting city attorney, Sonia Cavallo. Last month at a city council meeting, you said that once this welfare building is under construction, we could not stop it. But you said we could challenge its use. We feel that fraud was committed concerning its use. We are requesting that you follow up and not allow the county to use this as a TAD building, as a TAD welfare building. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carolyn, followed by Treasurer Tees, followed by Pharmacist Majid Siraj. Welcome, uh, Carolyn. Okay. I'll be brief. Um, I'm located uh, in San Bernardino, roughly in the area of 20th and D. There's a problem. We have constantly persons dumping garbage. And in a situation that I believe is like, you know, how you've been contracted maybe to clean a lot, and rather than take the, the items where they should go, you're, you, they're using our alleys, they're using the side of our residence, and et cetera. And my theory is, is if we were to put cameras in these areas, get license plates numbers, and then citations, Logically, I believe that would somewhat help render the problem. And I, from the other young lady, I, I, I understand now it's just not in my area. I'm a person, I believe community means no matter what your racial, your financial, whatever, we're here together, we need to work together. And I'm logical, I'm not emotional. Money, if you hit my pocket, I'll stop it. Because what they're doing, it brings our community down. And I'm going to close on this, because when I first came to the community, there was a huge uh, dumping of garbage. And I called, and no one reacted. So I took my little happy self, and it took about two or three weeks of my trash cans of picking up this trash, because it just irritated me, because it made place for the rodents, and et cetera. As I was going through it, I realized it was four years of dumping. I saw receipts in there that were four years old. And it was such a sense of apathy in the community. But by that one act, I noticed another neighbor then began to take interest and not say, oh, it's their problem, but it's our problem. So if I leave nothing else in this room, no matter what your position is, you work here, it's our community. We need to work together. We need to come together. Whatever it takes, it, our area can come back alive. There's hope. Thank you so much. Thank you, Have Carolyn. A great one. Carolyn, we, we have your information, and uh, we're, we're working. Um, Don Smith is 
uh, we'll be working on some of your issues, Ms. Um, Carolyn, and we appreciate your comments here tonight. Our next speaker is Treasurer Tease, followed by uh, Majid Siraj, followed by Perling Jones, I think it is. Perling Jones? Yes. Mr. Ortiz, welcome. Mayor and Council, uh, I wanted to address item 14 because I read the backup material. And one thing that we appreciate in our backup material is that the city is responsible for recommending and never directing. Um, but that's not my responsibility. You don't have the money to hire an legislative advocate. You based the original budget for that position off of the loss of Gigi and Gary's salary, which as we all know was based on nothing more than retaliatory measures because a $52,000 savings was never going to equal the 150 to 300,000 plus you're trying to use for this position. In the back backup material, it states that everything that is going to be based off of this is looking at whether or not you're going to win an appeal. And right now, that $52,000 savings is now a $500,000 expense to the taxpayers of this city. And what I need you to understand, and the public as well, because I get hit with this a lot, is this positive, positive, positive. At the basic level of understanding, think positive. At an expertise level to your fiduciary responsibility to this city and its residents, you are failing. You are overexpending the budget, and it's not enough to just talk about the reserves. The reserves are going to be depleted next year just based alone on our unfunded PERS liabilities. What we're talking about is the current allocations in the budget, which you are maneuvering money. We have an animal shelter that is running out of food. There people have to bring cans of animal, uh, canned food. You're looking at asking the residents to put fundraisers on for park renovations. You don't have the hours to keep the libraries open, and our services are repeatedly cut, but yet you believe that somewhere in our budget lies the ability to hire at this type of monetary funding. You have to know what you're doing. The budget relies on you. You fail at the budget, the city fails. Ladies and gentlemen, what is happening in our community, what the residents do is awesome and amazing. Great civic engagement, great events are going on, but what that is, that is the flowers and that is the grass outside of a house that is empty and the bills are not being paid. Please do not be fooled. We went into bankruptcy, not because you lost your job, because this council did not do their job. Our property values did not depreciate because you didn't make your house look nice. It's because they didn't enforce the blight control and we failed. This is the failure. We have a, 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 an amazing class of people, doctors and lawyers and, and educators, yet we have no middle class economy. Take this into consideration in your vote tonight because your votes matter. Regardless of what we say, you impact us, and at nine months, you are all responsible for where this future is going. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Our next speaker is Majid Siraj, followed by Perlin Jones, followed by Cheryl Brown. Uh, good evening, Mayor. I just have a quick question. I'm speaking on item number 18, which is part of the uh, quasi-judicial hearing, not part of the public speaking. Would you like me to... Okay. Go, go ahead. You have three minutes. Sure. Thank you. I'm speaking on item number 18, which is a request to amend uh, uh, the commercial cannabis business permit uh, for uh, uh, Nibble This. Uh, it became clear four weeks ago, which was pulled, uh, the same item was pulled from the agenda, uh, that through some public records, uh, uh, Nibble This did not have a valid uh, lease at their location that they uh, are seeking to uh, um, move their application. Uh, the recommendation of the Community Development Department uh, is that uh, the council approve uh, such a change of location uh, because uh, it has not been, the, the, because the applicant has not been able to secure its property at its original application address uh, and there's ongoing litigation uh, with the landlord. That is completely irrelevant. Number two, staff recommends approval of the amendment to allow a change of location since the applicant cannot force the property owner to make a, the location available. Again, that is irrelevant. Here are some facts. 
the applicant received a property consent on uh, June 18th. Shortly thereafter, on July 9th, they rescinded the lease. And on Ju and July 12th, they returned the key back to the landlord. Not only they returned the key, but they have a tracking number. The litigation against them shows the tracking number for the key returned. Please be aware that this was well before phase two, well before phase three, and well before phase four when the license was issued to this applicant. Please keep in mind that the location was a central core requirement, a central tenet of the application process. I tried to find an analogy, and I had a hard time finding an analogy, how you could get a notarized signature from the consent from the landlord, blow out of your lease a week or two later, and go through the entire process and now seek to change your location. Is that fair? Is that fair to those who have valid leases all the way through and continue to do so till now? I couldn't find really an analogy for that. Again, I request that you, you not approve the location change even though they've been granted a provisional license because initially they did not have a valid lease and a valid location which the app with license was granted on, based upon. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your comments. Our next speaker is uh, Perlaine Jones, followed by Cheryl Brown, followed by John Schollenberger. Hi, my name is Perlaine Jones. I find myself being paroled here in the Fair City. I'm originally from Chicago. I was recently released in August 3rd from uh, CCWF. Uh, I was released without any ID, uh, with no place to stay, and for the past two months, I have still been without ID. There, so, as a 69-year-old woman, a senior citizen, I have tried to resource here 211. There are other resources here for homeless people, and there's none available. I've been put out uh, the bus stop, police have put me out the bus stop, police have put me out the park. There's no bathrooms, there's nowhere to get water. So what kind of resources are you providing from the homeless, for the homeless? I found a situation today where I was at the park and I noticed that you, you had some city workers working on the streets. They had a porta potty, but the porta potty was locked. Why would you lock a porta potty up? just to keep the homeless from using the bathroom? Why don't we have water fountains? Why don't we have somewhere to use the bathroom? I, why don't some of the people on parole have somewhere to charge their monitoring devices? It makes no sense to have people in a city where you have no services for them whatsoever. And, and I, I just don't, I've never seen anything like this in any other city in the United States, and I've traveled all over this country. But this place is amazing, that downtown section of uh, San Bernardino is building this really major disrepair. But I would like an answer to what kind of services will you provide for the homeless in the future where they will have at least water, a bathroom, or some Ms. Ms. Jones, let, let, me, let me have staff turn the microphone on, back on, please. We want to make sure that you get your public comments in the microphone. It makes no sense that I have to live like this. I'm 69 years old. I can't even rent a room because I was released from a facility that didn't even provide me with identification where I can rent a room somewhere. It makes no sense that a senior citizen who is offered a lot to this country has to be Somewhere where I can't get the bathroom, can't get water, can't charge a phone. People out there, we need help, we need assistance, you understand? Know One more thing I want to address, because I don't want to see on that homeless. I have, I'm renting a storage space from U-Haul right there, downtown San Bernardino. I have a problem. I looked at, they have roaches, rats, they have no emergency uh, exits. And I looked on there. Uh, paperwork. You Ms. all Jones, haven't had an inspection since. Jones, well, can I say this? You all hasn't up. had an inspection since July uh, 2011. 
How can a place be in operation who hasn't had a city inspection in that long period of time? Thank you, Ms. Jones. Your time is up. Thank Our you. next speaker is Cheryl, uh, Cheryl Brown. Welcome. You, you know, um, I'm going to speak for me, and I'm also going to speak for Hardy, but that is heartbreaking that we have that situ situation happen to seniors in our community, and it hurts my heart. I don't know what I could do about it, but yesterday was the International Day of Older Persons. Now, we really didn't celebrate it here in San Bernardino, but we did celebrate it in England, and we did celebrate it in different countries across the, across the world, and in Los Angeles at USC. I just wanted to say that, because I think it's important, and I really think that we need to do something to help homeless seniors in our community. That's my, that's mine. Now this is Hardy's. <laughs> this is a letter to the mayor and the council. I've been a taxpaying citizen since 1961, trying to do my civic duty in contributing to this community. I seldom speak before go government bodies unless I feel outrage in the direction of their decisions. I came before you after you decided to elect five officers that didn't reflect the diversity of our city to lead your community policing program. Since those times, I've discovered, discovered other decisions which do not reflect the community values of justice, fairness to the citizens who pay taxes and live here. You have promoted people in top management positions who chose not to live here, which does not give others internally or externally an opportunity to even be considered, thus keeping blacks and Latinos locked out of your stated equal employment opportunity policy. You are perpetuating a system of structural racism, dis race, racial discrimination that dates back decades before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. You devalued the minorities and minority employees with these decisions that have forced some to live, uh, to leave our area working for friendlier workplaces. The Riverside Community College newest chief of police left your police department in the last two months. She was the first African American female lieutenant. Other blacks have left the city to become chiefs in other cities. You reduced the salary of the highest ranking first Latino city attorney, the first LGBT citizen um, city clerk, and if that wasn't bad enough, you are voted to appeal the court decision to pay them their rightful salary. You've hired outside non-minority firm to survey and try to convince the Hispanic and black taxpayers who live in this city to extend Measure Z for you to give to the police officers who do not live here and will not hire citizens who pay the bill. Now we're asking the police, we, now we have the police officers association who do not live here, asking the city manager who does not live here to appoint an acting chief who does not live in the city as far as I know, and he made the decision to place the five police officers over the community policing program. I am demanding as a taxpayer and voting citizen that you order all the management positions to be posted for internal and external people who wish to apply and have the opportunity to do so. You should also adopt a sunshine ordinance with, that allows better transparency in hiring and promotions uh, and opportunities in this city. I'm extending an invitation to the city manager to speak before these organizations, West Side Action Group on Monday. NAACP, the Social Action Committee of St. Paul uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church, and the Black Voice News Editorial Board. And we want to see what her policies are and her intentions in filling management positions in the city, especially the current police chief and public works director's position. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Schollenberger. Mm -hmm followed by Christopher Kim, followed by Sandra Ibarra for Robert Porter. Mr. Schollenberger, welcome. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Um, I want to speak on item number 22, uh, the four-way stop at 28th and D Street. Um, I just want to echo what was said earlier by May, uh, Mary Van Meter. She is far more directly affected by that situation, as and I am too. Um, as she stated in her comments, we have people that are using 20, uh, 
28th is a cut through because they don't want to go through 30th to the lights at 30th. Well, when they come through there, they're coming at sometimes 40 to 60 miles an hour from E to D. It's just a short period of street. Well, all they do is do a quick couple of glances and go over, and the cross traffic doesn't stop. Well, then those people, and our, the traffic through there has increased dramatically. It's incredible. So they'll just come around and make a quick left and go down and go over there wherever they're going. I have seen a, a photograph of a car that was involved in an accident there that was flipped up on its roof. Faye sent me that photograph some time ago when, she's, when she happened upon that accident. So um, I, I'm basically here for public safety. In the name of public safety, it would be vital. For, for this council to um, s consider and to vote in favor of this four-way stop. It's desperately needed. And I think it's ridiculous that I'd have to even mention something like this, but we would like to have something like this affixed to those stop signs. Why should we have to, why should we have to tell people how to drive? Drive like your kids live here. This is your safety. <laughs> You know, so we, we want to, I want to say thank you to the Safety uh, Commission for, for hearing our comments and, and for taking this into consideration, and it would be um, a, a, a definite needed um, in safety improvement in our community. One more thing I want to touch on real quick. I talked to Jackie about, I want to revisit the, um, not just for this council, but for future council bodies. You guys need field reps. Every one of you need field reps. And you're saying, well, Schoenberger, we we're trying to balance the budget. What are you talking about? It ain't going to cost you a cent. You've got political science majors at these Cal States that could, that could do this, and you could use it as course credit. You've already got your team leaders right there. Utilize the resources you have and put them in a leadership position. They can oversee those, those field reps. It, it would just help everything move smoother. When I was in Riverside, our councilman in the fifth ward had a field rep, and he did a lot of the things, like David was at our uh, Neighborhood Association Council meeting. He was there and present, right there for the council. And he, and he can handle those community-based things, and you can take it back to the council and report in. It's, it's just going to help government move smoother. So thank you very much. Mr. Mulvihill. Mr. Schuldenberger. Ms. Schuldenberg, I've got a question for you. Sure. Uh, you went in front of the, you're going to have to answer it too. <laughs> Why don't you go, go, go to the microphone? Did the, uh, the, the, the Public Safety Commission, Yes. Heard, did they vote in favor of the four-way stop? I am under the impression that that is correct. Yes, this is the gentleman here. So uh, that being said, I'm just we. I'm just checking. Yeah, just check that, that the, the public yes. safety commission did vote in favor of it. Thank uh, you. Correct. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christopher Kim, followed by Sandra Barra, followed by Faye Allridge and Kathy Mellon. Mr. Good Kim, evening. Welcome. Good evening, uh, members of the city council and everyone here. Um, since I'm short on time, I'll make this uh, move on real quick. Um, according to the application process of cannabis, I'm talking about uh, item number 18. It says recommendation to approve the move, um, uh, nibble this from one address to another. Um, application number two clearly states that zoning verification letter is required. And then three, that has, um, oh, so that's, that's part of the application, first of all. And according to the public, uh, I mean, lawsuit, um, the people who apply for the, for the lease, nibble this, um, those group, um, they rescinded the lease in May of 24. So I don't know how they got, first of all, I don't know how they got this. They're claiming that they had rescinded in May 24th. So how did they get the letter dated June 18th? That, that's a mystery to me. And also, um, according to the ordinance, uh, the location is 200 points, and the uh, neighborhood compatibility plan, uh, plan is 300 points. That's 500 points. And I can tell you right now that uh, if you take away 500 points, they don't qualify. They're one of the last ones. They should be way in the back. So uh, it doesn't make sense. They never had the lease. They don't claim to have the lease. 
yet they got approved as number four, by the way. And now they're claiming they, they want to move to a different location because they have the approval? And the, and the city uh, recommend, whoever it is, uh, is recommending for an approval of this movie? I mean, if you go to any court, they're going to laugh. They're going to laugh at this. And believe me, this will end up in court. So I, I urge the city council to deny this and, you know, make it go to court and have another lawsuit against this. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Sandra Ibarra, council member. I have a quick one. Um, for those who know or haven't known, Robert Porter was um, recently, he went in for surgery, so he's not able to come here. And he wants me to share this with everybody. Mayor and council, good people, I made it. I will be back. I love you all, and I love San Bernardino. Our next speaker is Faye Allridge, and we do wish Robert Porter a speedy recovery. So Allridge, welcome. Thank you. I'm here to address item 22. I know we're beating it to death. We also appeared at the Safety Commission. Uh, we can't assume that you'll say okay, so we're here beating it to death, okay? And I'd like to say that, um, that I'm here today to encourage you to sign it off and to act on it right away. Um, as you saw, my community members have already said the problem we're having. I have it written all down here, but they beat me to it. Uh, I'd like to talk about our past and the, and the way that we ended up with a two uh, stop sign uh, instead of a four way stop sign. Uh, historically, it was four ways. And one city official that lived in the community at the time, it kept him from getting to work as fast as they wanted to. So two of the stop signs were removed, if you can believe that. And so we're fighting here today to get those reinstalled in our community. We've had cars go onto the 210 freeway, break the barrier, and go on. And it just so happens that they didn't kill anybody once the car went over the side of the, the way. The people that are rushing through our community use uh, D Street. We have no stop signs there as, as raceway. And then the cross traffic that does have the, the two-way stop signs, they hurry through it to get from E Street uh, to Arrowhead. I mean, we're just used as a thoroughfare. That's all we are. It's just a matter of time before an elder or a child is killed on our streets. And uh, the, four, the, the four families that are there with the, at the intersection with little kids, they live in fear. I mean, that right now they're living in fear of the city acting right away to get those stop signs in. So I'm appealing to you guys. Take it seriously. You know, I'm a senior now. I'm going to step off that curve one day, and I don't want to be killed or maimed or whatever. I mean, so please take it seriously. Put a date down where you can get those two-way stop signs back in there. We're fighting as hard as we can to keep our community from getting out of control with these non-resident, uh, out-of-control drivers. So I'm done. Our next speaker is Kathy Mellon, followed by Luis Ojeda, followed by Alyssa Payne. Ms. Mellon, welcome. Good evening. I'm here before you this evening to make sure that this body of elected are kept aware of my neighborhood's opposition to the project being built on Little Mountain and 27th, which when completed will be the, newly, will be the new county welfare office. Daily to and from work, I pass by and see the construction progress which this body allowed to happen. No, you didn't vote for it. No, the planning commission you appointed didn't vote for it, but the development code this body approved allowed for it to be reviewed and approved by the DERC committee process. 
even though the current development code requires a commercial professional office that's going to be used for social services, requires a conditional use Somehow the, the Planning Commission review and conditional use permit process did not happen. City staff did not follow the ordinances you must abide by and are held accountable to. This was not a mistake or a typo. This was an intentional directive that must be addressed and corrected. There is no possible upside or positive quality of life issue this project will bring to my neighborhood. The impact on traffic will mean further deterioration of the roadways. The minimal mitigation required by the permit will not alleviate the daily backup of traffic on the narrow bridge overpass that serves the 215 north and south on and off ramps. There is no transit, transit access adjacent to the property. No site after our security will stop the transient traffic and flow into our streets and neighborhoods. We will keep coming to these meetings and continue to press our concerns and request that this body rise to the challenge and address our concerns. Your silence speaks loudly. Your inaction is on our radar. Starting November, when candidates file, voters will be electing new po four positions. Ward 3, Ward 5, Ward 6, and Ward 7. Juan, Henry, Basine, and Jim. What would you do if this was in your neighborhood? How would you respond to your neighborhood's concerns? Who will or has contributed to your campaigns? This, does this body have the will to fix the flawed process which allowed this in my neighborhood? Thank you. Next is Louise Ojeda, followed by Alicia, Alisa Payne, followed by Pastor T. Elliott. Testing, one, two, three, yeah, it's working. Good evening, everyone. I'm happy to be here again in this club because that's where we are, a little club. We're always the same, right? Well, anyways, I want to talk to you guys about the animal shelter. And uh, all of a sudden, last uh, council meeting, we have so many animal lovers, right, guys? So we have uh, council members walking out to break the quorum. And other people that voted to send the animal shelter to Riverside. All of a sudden, now you guys want to look into it. You guys have been talking about this for the last two years. The little shelter, Mr. Figueroa, that you talk about. Such a simple project, right? That you guys have been talking about for two years. Oh, but yes, elections are coming. Now we need to talk about it again, right? And then just Make believe the people that you guys are for it. You guys are going to look into it again. And it's sad. How, how can we trust you guys that you're going to get a big project, Mr. Mayor, when you're traveling to China to bring big projects where you're not able to fix a simple, tiny, little animal shelter? It amazes me. Trust me, it does. But anyways, so I just want to remind the people of San Bernardino that what we have right now, they were complaining about the old administration, right? And you guys are doing exactly the same thing, playing politics again. Well, you're going to drag it to the primaries, and then you're going to drag it to November, and maybe after November we're going to have a resolution for this? I doubt it. But anyways, I hope the people is listening. And you always count on the people forgetting about things, but I'm not. 
And another in item 14, I don't think that we need to spend the money in this uh, state and federal legislative uh, advocacy services because basically it's lobbying. And I think the mayor travels enough already. And we don't have the money to do that. So frankly, we need to start putting our tax dollars to work. I'm not criticizing anyone. Uh, Mr. Valdivia told me once you were a council member, Mr. Ojeda, government works slow. And I told you, and I'm gonna repeat myself, government doesn't work slow, we do. And we as the people are letting you guys get away with inaction. We're not doing what we're supposed to do. And it's very easy to do it when there's a will to work and to do what's right. And I need you guys to do what is right for the community. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Alyssa Payne. Ms. Payne, welcome. Thank Commissioner you. Payne. I just wanted to say something really quick before I get home and make sure everybody did their homework. Um, to you guys sitting up here, and to a lot of you that work in public service, um, some of the officers that aren't here, I come up here to commend you, not on a personal note, just as a constituent and as a member of society. I watch you guys, your demeanor, and how you carry yourself in person at different events and on social media. And I've watched you guys each individually be criticized, be torn apart, your personal lives be ripped into because of things that are going on at work. And I can't imagine sitting at my desk Monday through Friday doing my job and hundreds of people having an opinion, ripping apart what I'm doing wrong, and throwing in personal facts about my family into my mistakes I make at work, whether they're intentional or not. So I wanted to commend you guys as a constituent for how you carry yourself because people are watching. And sometimes, like somebody mentioned quietly, you are judged by your silence. And I respect how you guys carry yourself amongst everybody ripping apart what we're trying to do as a city. And as much as you don't agree and you sit on your high horse and tomorrow a lot of you a few of you will be on social media ripping apart people and what happened here. These are people at the end of the day and they are working to make a better community and if you don't think so, 50% of the people I see online, I never meet in person. I can go to baseball games and softball games and food fest and community walks and I don't meet the people that are so judgmental. So to people sitting at home, so it's not working, that are gonna get on social media tomorrow, before you point a finger and look at the splinter in somebody else's eye, like the Bible says, look at the pole in your own eye. Get off your couch, get off your computer, don't be a keyboard activist, and get involved in your community. I've met 50% of the people sitting up here on the softball field, at Food Fest, at a park, by personal invitation, by going out of their way, and they are regular people doing their best. They were given a mess thrown at them, and they're doing their best to make the best of it, and to have people um, at home that are being involved in the community, thank you, because I think you guys will see what we have a great future coming in San Bernardino, and I want to thank you guys for what you're doing. So thank you. Well, thank you. That was uh, refreshing. Uh, Pastor Elliott, welcome, sir. Sorry, Commissioner Elliott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Com Council, um, just a couple of items and run through them real fast. Uh, I wanted to commend the uh, mayor and the council uh, for the street repair. Street repairs are going on everywhere. We haven't seen as many trucks out doing streets in years. And I don't know how you pulled it off, but it is amazing. I'm just glad to see some tar going down and some potholes getting filled. Uh, and I want to commit you on that. Uh, secondly, uh, by way of the uh, Public Safety Commission, uh, we did hear uh, a crowded, uh, to a crowded room uh, regarding item number 22, uh, uh, formerly the chamber, now the boardroom, uh, was filled. Uh, and uh, even afterwards, uh, I went out to that corner uh, at school hour and I sat there for two and a half hours and I literally wrote down 72 vehicles that went through that through that street at a high rate of speed I certainly wouldn't have went in front of them and I wanted to tell you that the uh, Public Safety Commission unanimously uh, voted to ask you all to approve adding uh, 
this four-way stop for those people in that neighborhood. In addition, uh, item number 23 uh, is a permit parking issue uh, that we also heard uh, over by Valley, and the residents can't even park it in front of their houses uh, because often people from the college and other where are parked on their street and they've got to go park way up by State of Brothers or somewhere else. Uh, the uh, public safety, I'm, I'm sorry, the um, public works has recommended uh, that we would put, that you all would put permit parking for those residents. They need it over there off of Rancho. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, unanimous unanimously uh, Commissioner, turn your mic, try your mic again. Eighty-five percent of the new sworn officers live in the area. I think that is fantastic. I, I was so amazed. Uh, and and uh, our, our acting chief, uh, the morale at the department, uh, we've had a chance to talk to officers, uh, uh, line officers all the way up. I randomly approach people and ask, what do you think of them? And there's a 200% morale increase in that department. It is amazing. Um, I, I, on the other hand, my, I, I, I want to applaud the work done uh, by Acting Chief McBride. Uh, the morale in the department is way up. Officers are volunteering. Who heard of that? Police officers are volunteering and working off the clock to do community events. It is amazing. And when I heard uh, 85 to 90 percent of the new officers coming in live right here locally, not in Orange County, not in Cabazon, but local, um, I was absolutely amazed. And I just want to commend that, and I hope that the council will do uh, what it what it can uh, in considering Chief McBride. He is producing phenomenal results, and I'm I'm not hung up one way or another. We want results, and like the young lady who was up earlier, I commend commend each of you. I think you're doing a great job. I really do. I don't think you can clean up ten years of a mess in six months, uh, but you're on the right track, and I applaud each of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We, uh, this concludes our public comment. We thank our uh, public um, speakers, and we thank you very much for spending your evening with us tonight. Moving on to our staff report segment, um, we have item number 14, and this is a um, presentation regarding state and federal legislative advocacy services. Uh, Ms. City, City Manager. Mayor and Council, as you recall, during the 1920 budget process, $150,000 was appropriated for legislative advocacy services. As such, staff released the request for qualifications on July 1st, seeking qualified consultants to assist the city in federal and state legislative advocacy. Proposals were due by July 31st. As a result, we received three proposals from state advocacy services and seven proposals from federal advocacy services. Following a detailed analysis of each proposal, which included an evaluation of each firm's qualifications, staffing, understanding of the city, and scope of work, costs and references, the two highest scoring advocacy firms and the four, excuse me, two scored highest for state advocacy and four for the highest for federal. The assistant city manager and I conducted phone interviews on the finalists in August of 2019. Following the completion of the interviews and reference checks, Joe Gonzalez and Son was selected as the top firm, ranked as the top firm for state advocacy services, and Townsend Public Affairs was rated as the strongest performing uh, for federal advocacy. 
Uh, state, as you know, we had Joe Gonzalez and Son for several years in the past. Um, they did things with, uh, they helped us with redevelopment dissolution process. Um, they related to uh, low and moderate housing and other items. They helped with bankruptcy assistance with CalPERS. They assisted with budget appropriations um, when the, uh, Assembly Member Ramos put in for us to secure funding for the general fund, or excuse me, general plan. They also assisted us with bill tracking. They actively monitor and participate in Sacramento's daily activities. And they also helped us with uh, Cal Recycle to obtain a continuance for our completions order hearing um, when the city solid waste recycling program. Uh, t for the federal lobbyists, Towns and Public Affairs was ranked as the top firm to provide federal legis legislative advocacy services based on their extensive experience serving the needs of the municipalities throughout California. They have offices in both Washington, D.C., Southern California. Towns and Public Affairs has pr uh, the personnel that can meet in person with the city without securing additional travel expenses and while also addressing the city's advocacy needs in Washington, D.C. It should be noted that while the proposed monthly rates presented by both Townsend Public Affairs and Joe Gonzalez and Son were the same, when state and federal advocacy services were considered in combination, Townsend Public Affairs presented a slight advantage over Joe Gonzalez and Son. Uh, working with a single advocacy firm with a staff based in Washington, D.C., Sacramento, California, and Southern California could make it easier to address issues that impact the city at all levels of government. Additionally, Townsend & Associate has offered a discounted rate should the council decide to move forward and engage their firm for state and federal advocacy services. Given this, the Mayor and City Council might opt to engage Townsend & Associates for both. Uh, staff has provided the Mayor and Council with several options from which to choose based on the ranking. However, this is certainly a policy decision that the Mayor and Council, um, and it's important that you are comfortable with who's representing the city on your legislative platform. Thank you very much, Ms. City Manager. We appreciate staff's re recommendations, and um, we will now deliberate here with the council members. First off, I want to ensure that we um, remain focused on the issues at hand. Our city is uh, 65 square miles large, nearly 250,000 people that we represent, with all incorporated um, seven unincorporated areas within our city. And so we have a very large need. We have deliberated this. Um, in the last six months, and this is a budgeted item, and so um, we appreciate staff's recommendation and uh, opinion on it. Um, this is now a policy decision that we will make and entertain now. I will uh, poll council members and uh, seek a recommendation, and uh, we'll start and begin with uh, Councilman Sanchez. Uh, yes, um, uh, for our city our size, we should be lobbying uh, the state and federal government uh, to secure funds that are gonna help us um, into a bright future. So at this time, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, that we direct the uh, city manager to make a counter offer to federal advocates of a hundred thousand dollars for a one-year contract uh, fulfilling all the responsibilities stipulated uh, in their proposal and making a counter offer to Joe Gonzalez and son uh, for fifty thousand dollars if either contract is um, if either contract is then is is rejected, then I move that federal ad, that uh, sorry that for federal advocacy we go with uh, we go with Capri and Clay the first recommendation from staff uh, at the federal level and then for state uh, advocacy to then offer um, that offer of fifty thousand dollars to Townsend Public Affairs. If I may, Townsend Public Affairs was number one for the federal. And I should add, I'm sorry, Mayor, I forgot one part. Townsend, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Townsend Public Affairs that actually contacted us after the agenda item posted on Friday and said that they would be amenable to $8,000 a month for both services, um, which would be a total of $288,000 Thank you. three years. Uh, Councilman, okay, Councilman so um, to, to make that amendment, so uh, as opposed to then offering, if federal advocates uh, reject the counter offer of a hundred thousand, then to then proceed to make an offer to Townsend Public Affairs for the sixty thousand dollars for federal advocacy, and then Townsend uh, for federal advocacy, and then Townsend Public Affairs as our second op as our second option uh, in the case of. Uh, the state advocate, um, Joe Gonzalez, rejecting our $50,000 counteroffer. I, Councilman Sanchez, just point of order here. You, you, you're throwing a lot at us. Um, you first off started with a motion on federal advocates. Uh, in my conversation with, um, just as part of the transparency, 
Monday afternoon at 5 o'clock, I received several phone calls from various entities that have contacted me regarding the quality, the caliber, and the competency skill set of what staff uh, has recommended as compared to what the policymakers need to decide on. One of which was a former congressman that spoke very highly of um, a firm and uh, was not too um, recommending of other firms. That's, I'll leave it that way. And so the bottom line is Federal Advocates is a premier partner at the federal level and the hundred thousand dollars in my conversations with them they are willing to negotiate and bring that down to a hundred thousand dollars regarding Gonzalez and company that is one of the recommendations for state I did speak with Jason Gonzalez who is a principal there with Gonzalez and company <clears throat> we spoke Monday afternoon and uh, he was very amenable to work with the city he uh, extended a offer and just this morning at about noontime he also concurred with me to lower the price even more to meet the budgets of our of our community. So um, the recommendation uh, from my perspective would be that we go with federal advocates and Gonzalez uh, for the stated amount of 150,000. Um, so we have some some concurrence on on those budget needs. Um, so Councilman. So again, if for whatever reason uh, the uh, federal advocates for, uh, for, federal ad for federal lobbying do reject that, I then want to proceed to um, to offer the uh, offer the contract to Townsend, um, and then again, uh, same goes with uh, the state advocacy. Then we first uh, we first make a counter offer to uh, Gonzalez uh, uh, for the total of fifty thousand dollars, and if they reject that counter offer, we then make that same offer to Townsend. Is that your motion, sir? Uh, with one last thing, uh, these lobbying firms, uh, my understanding is that they have a practice of sending out weekly updates. Uh, I would request that those updates also be um, that those those updates also be sent to the electeds. Very good. Is there a second to the motion? Second to the motion. I will second that motion. Very good, Councilmember Barra. I'd actually like to make an alternate um, motion that we reject the advocacy services at this time until we finalize the salaries of our city clerk and city attorney. Um, the reason being, I also just want to publicly say it here on Friday, I did email our city attorney um, and our city manager asking to reconsider for a closed session uh, to take another vote for the appeal uh, against the, um, the judge's orders for our city clerk and city attorney salaries. I never got a response. We didn't even have a closed session today. So with that said, I, I did mention at the budget hearing, Mayor, that as the figurehead of the city, you are our legislative advocate. We have assembly members, we have congressmen, we have senators in the area. This is when you're supposed to talk to them and tell them what their needs are for our city, not hire outside consultants to do the work for you. Once again, I stand by my position. I once again want to make a motion that we reject this um, advocacy services for the time being until this is all finalized. Second. Okay, there's a second. Members would please cast their votes to reject uh, advocacy. Uh, the point of discussion on my perspective is uh, I want to encourage council members this is a budgeted item. We have, we have suggested to our community that we do need these uh, services. So I encourage you to please reject this motion. Members would cast their votes, please. Um, it's a substitute motion. We can call for the question after everyone's had their opportunity. Go ahead, to speak. Mr. Surratt. Um, You'll be recognized nothing, for five minutes. Nothing could be further from the truth uh, about this being budgeted. I mean, if you, you want to talk about spin, um, it was budgeted. It was budgeted based on uh, winning in court to reduce the salaries of the city clerk and the city attorney, um, which was at the time. Um, these sound so cliche but it was penny wise and pound foolish to go after that and it turned out to be uh, not only penny uh, unwise but uh, a ton foolish it was stupid it was something we shouldn't have done and we lost in court we're now facing an appeal which is even worse and the newspaper itself put out that we're, we're the, that second cliche is that we're, we're putting good money after bad so to say that this is budgeted is not really accurate at all sure it's in the budget but there's no budget there because the money that we thought was going to cover that 
that uh, hole is not there now that we're having to pay uh, what we have. And we're still facing pending litigation, uh, not only from our city manager, but from uh, the appeal here. We've got a lot of things coming forward that are not budgeted. And I've been telling everybody, we're indoor, and, and Treasurer Ortiz said it well. Uh, my colleague here, I agree with completely. We have a, a councilman, I mean a congressman in town. His office is right here, Pete Aguilar. We've got assembly member uh, uh, Gomez Reyes that is right here in town. In fact, I think she's in, uh, in Van Air Tower, at least she was for a while. Uh, but they're here locally. Um, we don't need it. We didn't need it when we talked about it. We don't need it now, and for sure we can't afford it. So I uh, wholly support uh, not just continuing this. I mean, I'll, I'll vote against it tonight, without a doubt. Um, but, but I don't think we need to bring it up until we start seeing uh, some increases in our budget, in our revenue stream for our budget. We just don't have it. We're uh, putting good money after bad uh, for lawyers. Um, and, and for uh, a, a lot of things that we just don't need to be doing right now. So I couldn't say it louder that uh, this is not a budgeted item Thank you, at Council. all. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to call the question. Like Members would please cast their vote on the motion to reject. Can we do a, a voice vote on this particular yes. one? Mr. Sanchez? First of all, I think uh, there's another council member here who wants to speak on the email. Is that the case? Exactly. Go I'd ahead, like to make Mr. a comment. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've called, asked to call the question many times, and the, the Go ahead, sir. goes on. You're, you're recognized. Well, i got five minutes. Go ahead. Uh, the, the point is, is that uh, I think Councilman Charette takes a lot of the arguments that, that I would make. But the point is, is that uh, we've been drawing down our reserve funds for virtually every new uh, expense that comes up. and. I know the Councilman Charette has really called uh, people's attention to that. And so uh, this particular issue, we have elected officials. I mean, their jobs are our advocates. And we've got really close connections with Ramos and with, uh, with our other assembly people and senators and so forth. Um, at the present time, we need, to start, we need to start looking at where we're spending our money and looking at the reserve funds that are, we're being drawn down on. Um, and I'm also really concerned uh, that uh, uh, looking at what the staff did, looking at the staff report that was made and their suggestions, and then, uh, Mr. Mayor, you said, well, you got some phone calls, and you want to promote, you heard some good things about uh, the, uh, what are the federal advocates. Um, I, I guess I'm only concerned that uh, we're looking at some, some backroom dealing here. Uh, you, you've got some uh, congressmen from you know, friends with and so forth. Uh, I, guess, I guess I'm really concerned about uh, proposing to support people uh, because, again, you know them, uh, among other things, that they really, the, again, the staff has done a very uh, extensive job looking at these people and I just think you know getting a phone call from somebody late Friday afternoon is it shouldn't be able to, to change what the staff's recommendation has to be it really concerns me that that was brought up but uh, I'm going to vote for the uh, for the alternate motion because I really think that we, we need to look at the money where the, the reserves we've got and what we're spending thank you thank you sir <clears throat> the motion is uh, made by Sandra Barr, seconded by Councilman Charette to reject federal advocacy services, and if members would please cast their votes. I encourage members to not support this. Mr. I think we're rejecting the, the whole issue of the advocacy program. Members would please cast their votes. The item is the substitute motion to reject the advocacy services at this time. Mr. Sanchez. Ms. Barr? Yes. Mr. Figueroa? Mr. Charette? Yes. Mr. Um, Nickel? No. Mr. Shard? No. And Mr. Mulvihill? Yes. Very good. The so the floor motion and the item fails on the alternate. We're uh, now back to the main motion made by Council Member Sanchez. If members would please cast their votes to that effect. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Good if Council I, Nickel? If, if I could ask for a, uh, a friendly amendment. I just want to make sure now the motion will include those uh, weekly written updates correct 
Okay. Yeah, so, so my understanding is that the, the current practice with the lobbyists at state and federal level are that they send to staff uh, weekly updates on new legislation taking form. I would like that those those weekly updates also go to electives, whether it's through the contractor themselves or through, stra or through staff. Yeah, and I just want to add, we, we are going to have uh, later this month our first uh, strategic workshop. And I think it's very important for the public to understand um, when we talk about advocacy, lobbying, whatever we're talking about, whatever terminology you wish to use, the fact of the matter is this is our money. Um, the tax dollars you pay, a good component of that doesn't come to the city. It goes to the state and federal government. Um, and for us to get that money back, yes, we have elected representatives. Yes, we have individuals within the legislature. We have one representative for this area in, in Congress. Okay, We have two representatives in an assembly of 80 people. Okay, So let's put this into context. We need a team. And any city of our size and caliber has an advocacy team working for them in our state and federal capital. The fact that we are the largest city in the county, we are the county seat of the county, and that we have individuals that would say, we don't need this. This is how we get that revenue back. The fact of the matter is, folks, you are paying every day taxes that are going to Sacramento and going to Washington, and it's our job as your elected officials to work to get that money back. So we can use that revenue to your benefit. And to say that we don't need to do that is abs absolute nonsense. So we need to have this program. Now, I, I think there's good debate in terms of which firms are the best ones to work with, but we need this service. We cannot get this money back. We cannot add this to our revenue base unless we have a team. And yes, we need the mayor in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. advocating as well. But he needs a team that's not only working within the legislatures in Sacramento and Washington, D.C., but also working with those individual departments, okay? Those departments have staff that you need people with experience and connections and, and the ability to work with those decision makers that ultimately decide who gets that money, when and how. And we need to make sure we have the best opportunity possible so our staff have the resources they need to do the job that we're elected to do to provide the services that you already pay for. So to say we don't need this is silly. I will support the motion. Thank Point you. Of order, Mayor. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, um, thank you. Um, of course, Council Member uh, Nichols said a lot of things that I wanted to say. But I just say to the residents, it's time that we make an investment. And we make an investment in our city. And this is an investment. It's not a huge investment, but it is an investment. We need to get money back into our community. He talked about the size of our community. Look at the state of our community. We, get, we hear tirelessly. We hear people talking about how we need to grow our revenue, how we need to do things different, we need to do things better. But the minute we make, we make a decision, everybody gets up here and says, oh no, we don't need that, we don't need, we need this. We need our money to come back to our city, we need to make investments. And we need to stop mixing apples with oranges, because that's a lot of, the, a lot of what happened here tonight, mixing apples with oranges. Let's make an investment in our city, and let's keep our city moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. If members would please. Point of order, question. Mayor. Ca yes, uh, Council Member. If Which I may. One? Um, Which one? Council Member Barra. State your point of order. My point of order. I, I do want to make a comment, though. I work for a nonprofit. My director from the nonprofit, she goes to Washington, D.C., and she lobbies. She also communicates with the local elected leaders. Why can't we do the same here? Why can't our mayor do the same? Uh, I'm, Mayor, I'm, I'm Mayor you, have, with that. you have a full staff in your department mm -hmm. for just one person. City Council only has two staff members. And I want you all to, my, my fellow colleagues, please reconsider because we are still pending litigation for our city clerk and city attorney's salaries. Where is this money going to come from when the mayor already has a full staff and we don't have this budgeted if, again, we fail that appeal? I was not here during closed session when that vote happened. I asked for a reconsideration, reconsideration to vote on it, and nothing was done. So this is where I stand, Mayor. And I want to let you know that as 
working with a nonprofit that does their own legislative advocacy for their nonprofit. That's something that even our own city mayor can do. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, if member, if there's no more discussion, Council Member Figueroa. I I'm not going to go off on rent. I just have actual specific questions uh, regarding the actual interview process here. Um, of the firms that were interviewed, uh, how many lobbyists have direct prior work experience in Washington, D.C.? And I'm, I'm, these are more specific to the, the federal level. Yeah, I would have to go through each of these to, okay, well we then, had seven of them. Okay, so then that yeah. really eliminates a lot of my subsequent questions <laughs> then. Um, but I can get these to you. Okay, never mind. Would please cast their vote. Can I clarify the motion? My understanding of your motion is to authorize the city manager to make a counter offer to federal advocates for $100,000 and to consolidate his company for $50,000. And if that is rejected, to offer the contract to Townsend Public Affairs for both the federal and the state, along with weekly updates to the mayor and council, legislative updates. And I want to make sure that I, I heard correctly from staff. Uh, the next, uh, for both, no, sorry, for. Um, for the state advocacy, uh, Townsend was the number two ranked. For, so instead correct? of Gonzalez, it's Townsend that you'd like for the state advocacy? So which one was the the, hold, hold on. Point of order here. Uh, the, the, is a clarifying question, Ms. Hannah, on the, on the if the contracts fail? No, it's, no, it's the, um, the counter offer to federal advocates and who the second firm is whether it was Townsend or Gonzalez. Gonzalez. It was Gonzalez. It was Gonzalez, okay. And then if it is rejected to offer the contract to Townsend Public Affairs. Correct. And request weekly updates. The With the second council. by Councilman Nickel. Yes. Members would please cast their votes. Mr. Sanchez. Yes. Mr. No. Yes. Mr. Is this for a one-year contract? Staff was proposing three years, but I thought you said one year. So is that what the motion is? Uh, so this is, all right, I, then I guess I'm missing answer on something because I want this for, to be for one year. Okay. This is, I, if you're watching, our representatives are watching, I want you guys to know that I will vote this down. If I don't see a huge return on investment, I will vote this down next year. I want this to be a one-year contract. Very good. Thank you. One year. If members, uh, Mr. Shrek, cast your vote, please. No. Mr. Nickel? Yes. Ms. Richard? Yes. Mr. Uh, Mulvihill? No. The item passes um, four to three. Thank you very much. The item passes. Item number 15, uh, Waterman and Baseline Neighborhood Specific Recovery Plan, and our staff will make a presentation. Mike Huntley, the Community and Economic Development Director, is here to present this. Um, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, the item before you tonight is for the City Council, or I should say the Mayor and City Council, to consider authorizing the City Manager to prepare a, a recovery fee uh, for the area of the City included within the Waterman Baseline Neighborhood um, Specific Plan for inclusion within the City's um, user fee. So for the benefit of the public as well as the Council, in 2015, um, National Corps, it's a nonprofit home builder, um, submitted an application to the city to consider the development of a long-range master plan including 710 acres of the city at approximately Waterman and Baseline. National Corps' proposal included the creation of a specific plan for this area as well as a variety of other entitlements that went along with their project. So the Waterman Baseline neighborhood specific plan was established as a land use tool. Um, it set some um, um, development framework and identified the needs for transportation in, in infrastructure um, improvements and served as a marketing tool to attract business. It also focused on the creation of affordable housing and increase in housing within this area of the city. In December of 2016, subsequent to community um, outreach and feedback, the City Council, I should say the Mayor and the City Council, approved a resolution to certify the environmental impact report for the project, as well as approving an ordinance that adopted the Waterman Baseline Neighborhood um, Specific Plan. It's been almost three years since that was approved by Council, and um, National Corps moved forward with a number of phases for their project. 
Phase one, which is the first part of the project, has been built and approved. They're now moving on to the phase two component of their project. Um, the city is close to actually issuing permits on that so the housing project can move forward. Um, the reason why we're here tonight is National Corps has now come back to the city and actually engaged us and asked us to include a um, recovery fee to offset the cost that National Corps put together for the creation of the um, strategic plan, but that included a number of other components in the creation of that plan. Um, they have provided a scope of work that included a number of items within their budget, and what they're looking at is a recovery fee of about $543,000, and that would cover all the work that they did to create the plan. Um, now, I do want to point out, as part of that, both the city as well as the county provided a lot of additional financial assistance for this project, as well as the state did. Um, now, as part of the Waterman Baseline Neighborhood uh, um, specific plan, it did include a number of other components, one of those being Chapter 8, which is actually the implementation and administrative plan that does call out a um, recovery fee. In addition to that, it also calls out Appendix D, and Appendix D lays out the methodology for actually calcing out that. Um, and really what the intent of that um, recovery fee is, is this new development comes into the 710-acre area within the specific plan, developers would have to pay their fair share or a small percentage that goes into this um, recovery um, fee. Um, so specifically within both of those documents and any of the documents that was approved for the um, specific plan, nothing says specifically that the um, recovery fee itself was, to, was supposed to, to provide um, a um, recovery fee that would go to um, National Corps, but I, but I do want to point out to Council it was um, inferred that that would be the case subsequent to all the work they did on that project. Um, now I do want to also point out that if the City Council does direct staff through the City Manager to proceed with this, uh, I do want to point out that we're going to have to look at also adding an, an administrative fee to actually process this. So when um, Appendix D was in, in incorporated within the plan, it just laid out a 15 cents per square foot um, recovery fee based on, the square, or based on new um, square footage for each project um, within that area. However, for us to be able to come to council and actually suggest you consider this, we'll also have to look at some kind of administrative fee um, that would actually pay for staff's time. In this, um, to this point, we'd have to work with our finance department and talk to them about how the fees would come in, how we'd hold the fees, and how we would redistribute those fees to um, National Corps. So really the reason why we're here tonight is National Corps has asked us if we would proceed on this. I do want to point out in the 2016 council report, it did indicate to council at that point that at some point in the future the city would consider such a fee when it did a user fee study. However, the city has not done that and as such National Corps has come to us and asked us could we proceed and get direction from city council which brings us here tonight. So that concludes my presentation, and I'm available for any questions you might have. I do also want to point out there are some reps from National Corps here tonight. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Huntley. Uh, we'll open that up to uh, council members. Council Member Sanchez. I'd like to move the table, Adam. Thank There is a second. Members would please cast their votes. On move to table. Mr. Sanchez. Yes. Mr. Barra. I'll abstain. Mr. Figueroa. Mr. The motion fails. All right, the recommended motion is uh, as follows and stated in your uh, backup assignment uh, material. If members um, would like to address the floor motion as recommended by staff. Yes, I'll go ahead and take that up. I'd like to make a motion to consider. I will second that motion if I may have a quick uh, comment, sure. request for clarification. Um, Mr. Huntley, when do you anticipate that we would get some um, 
something back in terms of the administrative fee, what exactly that's going to be, what the impact is going to be of that? So if, if council provides structure tonight, then what we'll do is we will actually start discussions with um, National Corps. Okay. We also need to bring in our finance department to talk about the processing of it and what the administrative fee would be. So we'll have to look at each of the positions that would touch the fee, understand what that cost will be, and then at that point we'd have to come back um, with the appro uh, appropriate documents to council um, to establish the um, recovery fee and the admin fee. Well, first, I, and I'd also like to thank National Corps. Um, thank you for doing this for our city. Um, for years, I've been trying to find a way to get a specific plan completed for our Vermont area on the north end, and I've hit dead ends time and time and time again, mm -hmm. consistently told by staff and others we simply don't have the money told by developers that they simply don't have the money. It seems like we actually found a way to do this and do it in a fair and equitable way. Uh, I think um, what National Corps did was absolutely necessary uh, to bring back that corridor. Uh, and I appreciate the work you did on this. And I look forward to working with you over, it looks like, the next 20 years uh, to pay you back for the good work you did. So thank you. I look forward to working with you. Very good. Council Member Mulvihill. Yeah, and I just want to uh, extend uh, a little bit what uh, Councilman Nickel just said. Uh, National Corps is really one of our strongest partners. And if there's anything that the city needs, it's, it's partners. And we've been working with the National Corps now for several years. I'm looking at the, the renewal of Waterman, the Waterman Gardens now, the Arrowhead, uh, the Arrowhead uh, Village? Grove. Grove because there's Arrowhead Vista and there's, okay. Uh, but it's, uh, the, what's taken place over at the corner of, of uh, Baseline and, and Waterman has just been incredible. And uh, also the uh, connections that you're making for the city, I know uh, with Dignity Health and many of the other nonprofits that are coming together uh, probably offline with regard to what's uh, what's taking place here tonight. I really want to compliment you for your, your efforts. And I'll be voting in favor of this. Thank you. Very good. All right. If there's no other discussion points, so, council members. Yes, sir, Mr. Sanchez. Oh, I, I don't have oh, oh, yes. well, his, Let's do it. Well, Let's I just want to clarify I'm, because his motion was to consider. Um, so I'm assuming it's consider to authorize the city manager the floor motion. The floor motion. So, so the floor motion is to have the council and the staff consider um, a, some sort of, in the future, some sort of uh, recovery fee. And I will be voting yes. No. It's authorizing the city manager to prepare a recovery fee for the area, not to consider. No. Uh, my motion is to have the council and staff consider, uh, okay. consider uh, our approach forward. Um, when it comes to then uh, I will withdraw my second make a substitute motion about that just we authorize that we move the f the staff recommendation to consider authorizing the city manager to prepare a recovery fee for the area of the city included in the waterman and baseline neighborhood specific plan for inclusion in the city's user fee Very good. Uh, associated with a uh, second by the scene council member right mr. Sanchez I will be voting well on, on Henry's motion. I will be voting no. Okay, Miss Abara. Can you repeat the motion. It is the floor. It's the one that's printed in the agenda. Consider authorizing the city manager to prepare a recovery fee for the area of the city included in the Waterman and Baseline neighborhood specific plan for inclusion in the city's user fee schedule. I'll vote yes, but with one comment. If we can get the total amount of the recovery fees that the city will be. Just Mr. Figueroa. I've had the opportunity to also tour one of their current locations. I was very impressed with what's actually there as well, and that's a, a perfect model of what uh, this type of housing so should be, so I'm voting yes. And Mr. Charette. I know, but I'm, I, I cannot see this. Yes. Mr. Nickel. Yes. Ms. Richard. Yes. Mr. Mulvihill. Yes. The item passes. I'd like to, the same. Uh, I'd like to change my motion to yes. Okay. The item passes unanimously then. At this point, I'd like to, I'd like to make a point of order. Um, as, a, as a voter with the majority motion, um, I'm, I'm asking for a reconsideration. 
I'm asking for a reconsideration so that we can bring this forward before the council at the first meeting in November. Do I have a second? This is just so that we can clearly understand the issue at hand. Mr. Uh, Sanchez, um, w there's a time and a moment in our agenda that will uh, have that consideration. That consideration needs to happen now per the rules that we follow. Mr. Sanchez, if I vote with the majority, I have the right to make a motion. I have the right to make a motion for reconsideration. For what item, sir? That is the item before us, uh, item, item, number item number 15. Okay. So all I'm asking for is that we take a closer look at this item. I don't think that this council has a clear grasp on what we're approving. So I'm asking simply that we look this over and bring this back before the council November, the first council meeting in November. Ms. Uh, City Manager? Well, we will be bringing this back to you once we establish the fee, the administrative fee, and have the documents. It will be back before you. I believe it didn't we said about February it would take until this came back? February or sooner. Yeah, so you'll have another opportunity. This isn't final. This was just to make sure that we got direction to go ahead with what was necessary. Get direction test to go forward. Yeah, so it will be back before you. That, that, that next meeting will be to what exactly? To consider the administrative fee and to actually set up the process to collect the fee for the recovery fee for the project. It's correct. It's correct. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanchez. Moving on to item number 16, the amendment to conditions 19-06 for subdivision 1608 tentative parcel map and development permit type D. Move to table. Let's move to table. And I second I'll second that. Very good. If members would please cast their votes to table the item. Yes. Yes. Ms. Barra. Yes. Mr. Figueroa. Yes. Mr. Charette. Mr. Nickel. Yes. Ms. Richard. Yes. Mr. Mulvihill. Uh, I'm going to abstain too because I'm just not really familiar with what the. Uh, the item passes five to zero with um, two abstentions. Thank you very much. Moving on to, on to item number 17, the TEFRA hearing, issuance of bonds by the Independent Cities Finance Authority for the Royal York Estates Mobile Home Park. The City Manager. Mayor Paul Espinoza, our Finance Director, will be giving you a presentation. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Before you this evening is a noticing requirement for a TEFRA hearing. Uh, prior to the issuance of bonds to finance the acquisition and renovation of the Royal York Estates Mobile Home Park, a TEFRA hearing, a TEFRA public hearing is required to adopt a resolution approving the issuance of tax-exempt bonds. The bonds will be used in the amount not to exceed $9 million. The source of the repayment of the bonds will be limited to payments made by the owner to the Independent Cities Financing Authority or its agent or trustee. The city is not liable in any way for repayment of these bonds. Dave Tol uh, Tolman, president of the American Dream Affordable Housing, is available this evening to address any questions, concerns, or comments the mayor or city council may have. Mr. Espinoza, did you say $9 million? Yes, sir. There, has been a, there was a correction to the staff report and resolution. Okay. The amount is $9 million. All right. So the packet page that uh, council members, if you would please uh, annotate your packet page item 279 the bonds on the last paragraph the bonds will be issued amount not to exceed 5.670 that is incorrect correct it is nine million it is nine million dollars if members would please cast I'm sorry if members would please amend their um, note or see their annotated updated edition. apologize for the confusion no problem there if uh, members have questions uh, we'll open it up to council members I, I do have some questions uh, I'm not really sure who to direct this to. I guess I, I would imagine the applicant. Um, on, on package 284, which I'm sure they probably don't have that in front of them, but it is the notice of, of the public hearing. Uh, there is, on uh, paragraph 2, it refers to a related entity. So it is, uh, it reads, the proceeds uh, from the sale of the authority bonds, if any are issued, are intended to be used to make a loan to American Dream Affordable Housing a California nonprofit public benefit corporation or a related entity. Who, who is this related entity? Yes, thank you, Councilman. Uh, Dave Tomlin, president of uh, American Dream Affordable Housing. Uh, the, the notice that was given like that, uh, when the bond council uh, submitted that, 
it does add additional language. I can assure you that the uh, bonds are going to be issued to only one entity, and that is American Dream Affordable Housing, a nonprofit entity. There will be only one entity, and we'd be glad to stipulate that in your motion if you need to. Okay. Uh, is there a parent company? No, there's not. There's not a parent company. I think I read somewhere, somewhere else. Uh, geez, let me find it real quick. As far as a, it was the Tomblin something parent company. I would have to look for it, but I did see it somewhere else noted in here that there is a parent company. But I'll, I'll get to that eventually. I'm sure I'll, I'll, I'll see it again. Sure. Um, are you familiar with or heard of Santiago Management, Santiago Communities, Inc.? I'm sorry, one more time, Councilman. The Santiago Communities, Incorporated. Are you familiar with them? Or no, not at all. Okay. Okay. So then I guess uh, you, you would not be associated in any way, shape, or form uh, with, or Santiago would not be associated with this project in any way? That is correct, Councilman. Um, and this would be for... Uh, nonprofit bond financing, correct? Yes, that is correct. I, I, I do understand the interests and benefits of, of a nonprofit um, bond financing for, for the applicant, of course, uh, because it's because of the tax exemption. Uh, but what is the actual benefit to to the residents, to to the mobile home park residents? Yes, Councilman. Good question, and appreciate uh, addressing the mayor and the staff and so forth. Um, just a little bit of our background. We've been involved with the ownership and management of mobile home parks since uh, 1980, uh, both senior housing and all age uh, housing in a for-profit situation. In a non-profit situation, what, a, what is attractive that makes it good for the residents of the mobile home park is that, uh, number one, the interest rate that you receive uh, on a nonprofit bond issue like this, uh, not only is the interest rate very favorable to allow additional monies to be put aside for continued improvements, not only of the infrastructure, but also of additional community uh, enhancements. Uh, number two is that the long term bond financing allows for that mobile home community and the residents to be in existence far past what it probably would last for a for-profit situation. As an example, in this financing, which we could not get in the private sector, there's $125,000 set aside, uh, highly regulated. In fact, the, uh, the bond regulators here, for that $125,000, there has already been a, a uh, plan put in to make sure underground infrastructure, utilities and things of that are in place for the long term. But also one of the big things that we'll be putting in is, as an example, a community center, uh, which will greatly enhance, which where there's nothing there right now. Um, those monies are available now for the long term preservation of affordable housing. And that's, that's the biggest benefit. It, it, you're not straddled by for profit lack of funds to keep the property. And, and I'm glad you bring that up because currently there are really no amenities in that park other than I think there's a, a car wash that's really <laughs> just kind of beat up there. Uh, so it really does, uh, you, you know, there, there's no grass area, no picnic area with barbecue. There's no uh, gazebo area, no kind of picnic area. There's no, you know, there's a lack of trees and landscaping in that area. Uh, in other words, there's no just general uh, community recreational area. That's correct. Um, is that something that they, you, you, it sounds like you're willing to, I, I am familiar that there's a section in, in that park, a little bit northeast of that, of that park, that would probably be ideal for, for something as a, a community uh, recreational area. Is that something that you're willing to commit to and include that? Yes. And in fact, actually, uh, we're in our plans um, in 90 days past the close of escrow we would be ready or we're planning to be able to turn dirt, subject we get some permits, <laughs> to add a, uh, uh, a community uh, patio, grass, landscaping, barbecue, gazebos, 
a little bit of recreational basketball courts, things of that nature. Good, because uh, you know, springtime will be here pretty soon. Summertime people will probably want a barbecue again, so I would really love to see that. Yep. It sounds as though, um, have, have you actually performed a physical needs assessment of this park? Yes, part of the reason for the, or part of the requirement of the bond issue is that there's an extensive uh, physical needs along with a 20 to 30 year plan that those needs have to be re uh, funded very similar to a homeowners association with a reserve study uh, that's in place and uh, we have to follow that and that's how the hundred twenty five thousand dollar reserve uh, fund has been set up under the uh, direction of the uh, uh, overseer of, of that uh, bond issue under our um, municipal code for mobile home parks 8.90.020 it states that existing state law permits mobile home park owners to require mobile home owners to make modifications to their homes for reasons of conformity to park standards that amount to capital improvements. Will you be putting the burden of capital improvements back onto the residents? No, no, we would not be able to do that, number one, under the, the bond conditions. That's why they have the reserve fund set up to do that. Okay. Uh, because. Very often, uh, you know, mobile home parks are occupied by seniors, uh, persons on, on fixed incomes, um, and, and so any, any rate increase would greatly affect them. Are their rates going to go up? Um, the answer is no in order to qualify for the bond issue. In fact, we had to do a survey. We had to survey and uh, we actually have to, uh, in fact, there's going to be a follow-up survey. We have to go in as part of the bond requirements and IRS requirements that we will actually ask the uh, residents to provide proof of income. The survey of this park is that the entire park is either classified as low or very low income uh, occupants. So therefore, under that and the uh, nonprofit uh, bond rules and so forth, uh, okay. rent raises are very, very, very restrictive. Uh, you've pretty much answered a lot of my biggest concerns, is especially I, I have more than, than half of the mobile home parks in my district, and I heard it very loud and clear as far as a lot of their uh, gripes as far as some a certain management company. Um, and so I appreciate you... Uh, being upfront and honest as far as what's actually happening here. I, I do have one final concern, really, well, two questions here are, do we know of any residents or spaces in that, in that park that are under rental control? Do we know if that exists currently at that park? Yes, there are 22 park-owned homes that are rented out that are not under rent control. The, okay. uh, the remaining uh, out of the 93 spaces, the remaining 71 spaces are under rent control. Under, under control. Would, uh, would the transfer or sale of the park ownership in any way create a situation where residents lose their rent control agreement, or is it only upon the sale or transfer of the individual mobile home owner? Uh, no, Councilman. In fact, if it is sold to a nonprofit with this type of bond fencing, the uh, actual rent control and uh, Restrictions are even more restrictive than probably what's in place by the city. Okay. Well, then, you know, you, you've really satisfied uh, pretty much a lot of my concerns. With uh, So thank you for answering those questions. So uh, as far as the, the, the little community gathering area, I, that needs to be done. So I'm not sure if we can commit to that in writing and make sure we get that done, please. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're ready to commit okay, then to I, that. I will move to approve this item, please. Motion for approval by Councilman Figueroa. Councilman, I want to commend you. You're four months in here, and you're uh, eating a, a huge, huge elephant, and you're doing great on mobile homes. I'm very I, proud I of you. I pulled the, the municipal code right here. Very I good. read through it, and I trust me. I was That's trying awesome. to read through as much as I possibly could because this is a big concern, especially for for a lot of the residents in the third ward because many of them are mobile home uh, residents. Councilman, I, 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 um, you remember that I, I uh, was a councilman for that district and I remember all the mobile home issues in my, when I was served as councilman for that district. And I can so, imagine. Mr. Tomlin, in my conversations with you, I'm very appreciative of your commitment to residents in our mobile home uh, community um, at 2230 uh, West Chestnut. Uh, Royal Oak Estates uh, presents a great opportunity for partnerships in our community and we're glad to have partners to collaborate and uh, provide those park improvements. 
In my assessment and read of your information that you supplied to me, I'm very, um, very, very uh, grateful for your investment in our community, and uh, I'm wholeheartedly supportive of this uh, as a mayor. I think we need to expand this opportunity to our other mobile home parks, and I'll be walking, working with you and your team uh, to see how we can leverage greater opportunities. We have approximately 45 mobile home parks in our community. Of that, uh, at least 21 of them are in the third district. And so we are very, very fond of our relationship as we get to know each other and uh, begin this relationship to establish uh, the bettering and uh, improving of our uh, quality of life for residents in our mobile home parks. They are certainly uh, ignored and um, sometimes marginalized. And in my conversations over the seven years that I served as councilman for that district, I understand uh, what they go through. And um, we ultimately will need to revisit once we're ready and able, the city manager, to um, re, re, um, re enter agreements to um, also make sure that we get code enforcement back from CHED. Uh, right now it's in the county's, or I'm sorry, in the state's hands, and we want to make sure mm -hmm. that we have uh, a good relationship with CHED and making sure that we have those code enforcement issues. Many of times I've heard from residents, uh, flushing toilets, running water, uh, and uh, issues that really affect not only mental health but quality of life uh, for children are important. I'm very pleased to see that your park improvement uh, upgrades at the northeast corner at this facility will be installed. Uh, we hope to ribbon cut it by spring, and so we will work alongside you. That is our commitment as a city uh, to work expeditiously on those permits. Uh, Mr. Mulvihill. Yeah, uh, it's hard for me to expand on what, what uh, the mayor just said. Um, the usually when uh, an, uh, a mobile park issue comes up on our agenda, it's the fact that, as you say, leaking roofs or flooded homes or lack of services and so forth. But um, your firm has been in business since 1980. How many, how many mobile home parks do you, uh, do you have? Sure. Uh, our, our, it's not really a parent firm, but it, uh, Tomlin Asset Management has been involved since uh, 1974. Okay. Since 1980, uh, we have had 26 uh, mobile home parks uh, that range between all age and uh, um, senior adult parks. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> if there's no discussion, members, please cast This is a votes. public hearing. You need to, um, I know that there's some speakers who want sure. to speak on this. Uh, are there any members of the public that would like to address or speak on this item? Very good. We will now, members, cast their votes. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder, Ms. City Clerk. Appreciate My it. apology. Mr. Sanchez? Yes. Ms. Uh, uh, Ibarra. Who seconded this? Was this Mr. Mulvihill? Did you second this? I know you made the motion. I didn't hear a second. I'll second if needed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sanchez, you said yes? Yes. Ms. Ibarra? Yes. Mr. Figueroa? Yes. Mr. Charette? Yes. Mr. Uh, Nickel? Yes. Ms. Richard? Yes. And Mr. Mulvihill? Yes. The item passes 7 to 0. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Thank you. Tomlin. Yeah. Thank you. I may make a, a comment to everybody. Yes, sir. And I, I appreciate your comment about the future. We've found in our business plan over a period of time that once we start to establish in a community like this, that allows us to start to expand out and find some other opportunities. There's going to be a lot of owners that find that we can make that improvement, as you so stated. So we thank you so much. We do. Thank you. <laughs> we'll work together. <laughs> and Mr. Tomlin, um, I think this is going to get uh, Mr. Mulvihill a little excited here. Oh, really? Which Good. we did not even mention. This meets our arena numbers. And oh, so yeah. part of this action also complements uh, the arena numbers. That's Very correct. Good, yeah. That's correct. Thank you, sir. Very good. Thank all right, you all. Moving Thank on you. to item number 18, request to amend the commercial cannabis business permit to provide a change in location from 4130 West Hallmark Parkway to 506 South Inland Center Drive, and the recommendation is to approve this uh, request. Mr. Huntley? Actually, Mayor, we've got a team here that's going to oh, present good. this. Thank We're going to start with Sonia, our good. city attorney. We have... I move to table the item. 
Uh, I'll second that motion to table. Very good. If members would please cast. Deny or table? Uh, table. Table. Same thing. I make a substitute motion to deny. Deny. Well, I guess I can't with a table. Let's move to deny. table. Do you have a second? Move to table. All right. Can I? Is there a second? To deny. Second. All right, point of order. Let's let's get our let's get our. What, what is the what is the motion? Is it deny or? If there's going to be a robust conversation, then maybe we shouldn't. But I, I just moved to table the item. Okay. If there's an alternate. But can I now make a substitute motion? Yes. Substitute to deny. I'll oh, I'm it. sorry. On a move to table, you can't. So no, members would cast their votes. Well, the city attorney about well, members would cast their votes because in there's previous no in previous practice, we have not. Allowed for it, right? So if if your, members your practice, okay. would cast their yes. votes on a move to table. Yes. 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 My uh, tablet is confusing me. Um, I do have a request to speak by Jacqueline. I'm sorry, ma'am. Is it Venasia? Bonaccia. Welcome, ma'am. Thank um, you. you. You put in a public comment card on item number 18. Um, I, I did. Yes, ma'am. You're recognized for three minutes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I represent, I'm legal counsel for Nibble This on this item, and I uh, am here representing Nibble This because unfortunately its ma majority owner is out of the country when this was set today. And I'm actually here to encourage the City Council to uh, uphold the the staff's recommendation and to approve the the move of this location of this particular cannabis business from one location to another. Uh, Nibble this fully supported or fully participated in the permit process for commercial same, cannabis uh, business when it originally uh, applied and uh -huh. sco scored very well. It came in, I think somebody else said number four earlier. Um, it did have, after the fact, some problems with its landlord and was unable to occupy the location on Hallmark and was forced to find a new location. It did uh, locate a new location. It requested and obtained a zoning verification letter for that location, which is attached to your packet as 18A, and then it in turn followed the uh, precise terms of the municipal code applying for a change in location that is attached to your packet at 18B. It was appropriately reviewed by staff and uh, recommended for approval. I understand that there are some applicants who did not get permits in the original process and that they have challenged those permits and have made comments here tonight challenging this move. As the earlier commenter said, that is immaterial to what this council is being asked to review tonight, which is simply a change in location in, in uh, regard to the municipal code. For the response to one of the uh, comments that was made earlier, there is a valid lease for the location and all of the uh, requirements have been met for the change in this particular location. Now just to recap as far as Nibble This is concerned, Nibble This scored as high as it scored on its initial application because it is a sophisticated, well-planned business that has assured this city that it will be a community partner, that it has a neighborhood compatibility plan, that it will look to safety, it will look to being a part of the community and hire locally. And for all those reasons, I really urge this uh, council to take a good look at this and to approve this uh, change in location on behalf of Nibble This. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. If members would please cast their vote, and if uh, the clerk would please announce. I'd like to change my vote from abstention to, uh, to tabling it. Yes. So um, with the change in vote, the item, to uh, the motion to table passes 7 to 0. Thank you very much. Moving on to our consent calendar, um, we will now poll council members. Uh, council member uh, Sanchez. No items to poll. Very good, sir. Council member Barra. None to poll. Council member Figueroa. 
Uh, just not to really to oppose, but just to uh, a brief little comment on number on, 23. On 23. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, 23. Very good. Councilman Shred. Yeah. Councilman Nickel. I had a, just one constituent question regarding item 24. If I can get that answered now, then I, I'll support moving forward. Sure. Question was, why was there any obligation of the prior owner uh, to pay for the remediation, or did we assume all liability as part of the acquisition of the property? It is they wanted some clarity on that because there was some discussion as to whether or not there was some potential liability on the part of the prior owner. We'll let Alex address that. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, yes, uh, when we obtain this property, we obtain all everything. Everything that is with it. Good, so, bad, and ugly. Good, bad, and ugly, exactly. Okay, thank you. Uh, does that satisfy you, no poll? All right, very good. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, I just want to uh, also item number 24, just that I'll be voting no for the reasons that the A and B bonds um, was uh, a lot of that funding was promised to the sixth ward and we have not seen any improvements on it and we want I asked the question earlier we need to find out how many how much fund the, with the balance of the funds are left and when are we going to get started with the with the uh, the um, the things that are happening in the sixth ward because you know um, uh, uh, Commissioner Elliott mentioned earlier he was so happy and excited about the streets and every everything is moving and they're doing all this work but none of it is happening in the sixth ward so I just want to make sure that we start using utilizing some of this this bond money that has been promised since 2004 in the community that it was promised for thank, thank you. you with that uh Notation on item number 24, uh, so we will not pull it if that's okay. Right. You just stated the no. You'll not vote no on it. Uh, Council Member Mulvey Hill. Uh, I have none, but I'd like to make a comment on item number 22, the four-way stop at uh, 28th and D Street. I live about 300 yards away from it, and uh, again, I, I, I recognize the problem, and uh, I'm so pleased that the, the residents will be getting their four-way stop, and I think we're going to be... Uh, you know, correcting a, an error that uh, has existed for a long time, and uh, I'm proud to see that it's going to take place. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, Madam City Attorney, is that an abstention because you're close to the property, or? Uh, 300 yards, it's about nine oh, yards. Six, oh, okay. You said 300 feet. Okay, very good. All right, so we're good. All right, sir, um, if members, uh, we could get a motion on the balance. Move the balance. Second. Whatever's Move the balance. Yeah, whatever. Yep. We're all whatever no. Got. We got one pulled. <laughs> yes. Okay. Mr. Sanchez. Yes. Ms. Barra. Yes. Mr. Figueroa. Yes. Mr. Charette. Mr. Nickel. Yes. Mr. Shard. And uh, Mr. Mulvihill. Yes. Item passes seven to zero, except for number twenty-four, which is uh, six to one. Very good. Um, the item number twenty-three has been pulled by Councilman Figueroa. Mr. Figueroa. I, and, and, not, and again, not pulled for any opposition. I was willing to just make a brief little comment. Uh, I, I simply want to commend the Rancho West Neighborhood Association for coming together. They are a recently established neighborhood association about three, four months ago. I've been, it has been an honor to, to be there with them. Uh, and this is uh, just a perfect example of neighbors coming together to, to, get, to resolve an issue that has been long plaguing their, their area. And under the great leadership of, of Juan Vasquez, I, I commend you. And our work is still not done. I've, I was recently meeting with some of the other neighborhood associations. Valley College is resurrecting. Uh, some of the other ones uh, down uh, in another part of, of, the, of the district as well are coming together. And so I'm happy to, uh, to, to vote yes on this. And, and great job to the Rancho West Neighborhood Association for, for putting this together. And I know that your work is still not done. So thank you. Is that a motion to approve, sir? Yes. Very good. With the second by Fred. Point of order, Mayor. Question. This has been a really big deal right, to them so for a very long time, so it would be an honor to Motion to approve, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Barra. I, I just have a quick question, um, and I hope our council realizes this. Um, I'm, I'm all for it as well. My only concern is going to be how Miyagi restaurants going to be affected. 
um, because that, that is their concern, the parking from the people going to that restaurant. I know is one of the jewels in the second ward as well, and my concern is they're going to start losing business. As, as is, a lot, we've lost a lot of businesses along baseline. Um, so I'm hoping that our city or we can do something to help remedy um, the parking that they need to, for, their, for their customers as well. Very good. Uh, if members would please cast their votes. Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Items to be referred to committee. Any council members? No, I have an item that I'd like to agendize. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that we agendize a review of uh, the resolution passed earlier this year limiting our um, what is it? Our, our discussions, our debates uh, to five minutes uh, per council member. Sure. I want a review as well as consideration of re uh, repealing or um, or doing away with that resolution. And I want that item agendized for our first council meeting in November. Staff, are you uh, are you fine with the first meeting in November? Yeah. We, we, if you want to vote on that first, then we can make that happen. Sure. Well, sure. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if there's no objections, we will hear the item on November 6th. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Are there any other items to be referred to committee or on agenda? Mayor, Mayor, uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, I would just like to um, um, have the status of the bond A and B from 2004. We want to find out the status of that so that way we can move forward. Absolutely. We'll update that report for you. All right, very good. Uh, Council Member Ibarra. Yes, um, I'd like to agendize, if possible, City Manager or Mayor, a meeting with the CDBG ad hoc committee meeting as well to get updates on the projects that have been in the pipeline and their status updates. That's a provision of the chairperson for CDBG. I encourage you to reach out to the chair, chairman, chairwoman, and uh, lobby your issues, and we certainly welcome your comments, Council Member, but uh, I don't think there's a need for us today to take up the agenda item. If, if the CDBG is a recognized ad hoc committee, we can, we can um, resurrect that item. Uh, I encourage you to um, submit your item for reference to the chairperson, and we will we'll accommodate you that way. Yes, Councilman Nichol. Yeah, I'm, I know that staff, uh, we, we did discuss this at the last uh, LRC meeting, but I know that we're going to have some discussion on a potential uh, discussion on the cannabis ordinance. Uh, I think given the, one of the items this evening, I do have some concerns about what appears to be some ambiguity or perhaps some need to refine the process a bit more. And I think what I'd like to do, I think our, our uh, deputy or our, our city attorney <coughs> has a good sense of what we may need to do there. And if she could provide maybe some recommendations back to the LRC in the context of that standing item that we have, I'd like to consider that as well. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, sir, sir as so stated. Um, we will now move on to our adjournment process. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm so sorry, Mayor. I just yes. want to make one comment. Um, Councilmember Ibarra did ask uh, about a reconsideration process. I um, uh, first wanted to say that make it clear to the council so you understand. Uh, only people who have voted in the majority on an item can actually make a motion to reconsider. An absence from an item does not give you the ability to, to make that reconsideration motion. So I just wanted to make sure Thank that you're you open, transparent, and got a response to her on that issue. Thank you. Thank you. What if it's a tie that is broken by the mayor, which is, you know... It would still then have to be those who voted in the affirmative. Voted, okay, yes. so the three that voted affirmative. Correct. There is also a, a limit on, on when we, that reconsideration can happen, am I correct? There is, and usually the general rule is that you have to make it at the same, at the meeting immediately after. So you have up until the meeting immediately after that decision was made. When you follow the most formal rules of parliamentary procedure, it shall occur after the item is acted upon. We as a city council don't. We're not Congress. And so we follow a more informal process, which allows you at the next meeting to make a motion for reconsideration. Um, no, you could, you could direct um, that to be placed on your agenda or to be brought back. Uh, what you have to do is actually take a, act on the motion to reconsider. And then once that, if it receives the majority vote, then you actually go back and reconsider the item. So it's a two-step process. Okay. Um, council members, we are, um, it's 941. We're almost ready to adjourn here. I'm ready to read the adjournment process. 
Um, if we could, let's let's um, let's move to that stead. This is our earliest, fastest council member. Just a moment. Uh, we we are almost done. We're 99 percent there. Uh, at this time, I want to recognize Mayor Pro Tem Basine Richard to read and make a presentation on behalf of Emma Shaw and her family. Yes, and so um, the legacy of Emma Shaw, I don't know if all of you guys know who she is, but you guys are getting ready to find out. Emma Shaw, the grandmother of the former Six Ward Council member Ricky Van Johnson, passed away on Wednesday, September the 18th, 2019. She was a local legend in our community, living to, living to celebrate 107 years. She was still so full of wisdom, discernment, encouragement, and honesty until her life's journey was complete. Emma was the, the matriarch of six generations and leaves behind an abundance of loved ones, family members, and friends to cherish her memory. Emma Shaw's wake will be held tomorrow, October the 3rd, 2019, at 6 o'clock p.m. at the New Jerusalem Church of, of God in Christ at 1424 West 21st Street here in the city of San Bernardino. Her, her homegoing celebration service will be held on Friday, October the 4th, the viewing at 10 o'clock a.m. and the services to begin at 11 o'clock a.m. at Ecclesia Christian Fellowship, 1314 East State Street, San Bernardino, California. And Mayor, I would ask that we adjourn this meeting in her honor. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to also um, recognize this uh, meeting in memory of Miss Emma Shaw. On behalf of the mayor, a lifelong resident of the uh, San Bernardino 6th Ward, Emma left a legacy of activism for healthy families, healthy communities, and healthy neighborhoods here in our city. We extend our deep condolences to Emma's family and ask that the community extend their prayers and thoughts to the Shaw family. I'd also like to offer our condolences on behalf of the Mayor and City Council to our family and friends in the City of Montclair. Um, on behalf of the Mayor and City Council, uh, we extend our condolences to the family of Tricia Martinez. Tricia unfortunately lost her battle with cancer on September 21. She was only 48 years old. She had dedicated her last five years to advocating for a community in the city of Montclair as council member for the city of Montclair. We adjourn in memory of these two ladies, our next general joint regular meeting of the mayor and city council. The mayor and city council acting as a successor agency will be held here Wednesday, October 16, 2019, Feldheim Library, 555 West 6th Street here in San Bernardino. Closed session will begin at 530 p.m. and open session will begin at 7 p.m. Thank you and have a good night.